Serious, Redditors who spend a lot of time working in isolation, research stations etc. What are your creepiest experiences? I work in a building that is high security because we have a lot of expensive equipment. If you want to get to my office you have to walk through 4 doors that require keycard access. It's very quiet and sterile. White walls. Nobody around. Very little furniture. Grey floors. Open ceiling so you can see the ducts. Sounds echo. I was working alone and noticed that there was a guy in the building. He was wearing the same shirt that maintenance wears. But it was weird because it was really late at night on a Saturday. He was also wearing jeans. And the maintenance people always wear black pants. He kind of gave me the creeps so I closed my office door and stayed there. I could hear the echo of him walking back and forth for a while. He tried the handle on my office door twice. I heard the beep of him try to open my office door with a keycard twice. It turns out that he didn't work there. He is the grown son of one of the workers and was walking around the building trying to steal stuff. But his dad's keycard won't open any offices because it's a handyman card with limited access. Handymen have to make appointments and you have to let them in. Unlike cleaning people or the techs maintaining the servers who can open any door. He got caught on camera and security check to see whose card had tried to open the doors. The guy are fine for trespassing and his dad got fired. Oh crap. Dad's pee. So my major has a computer lab that is two stories underground. I have spent countless hours using these computers and I have spent nights down in what us students call the dungeon. One night, around 2am, I went down the hall to go get some water. The lights use motion sensors. As I was filling my water bottle, at the end of the hall the last light turned on. So there was this dark gap between me and this last light way down the hall. I was mildly creeped out but then I saw something move in the darkness between me and the light. I proceeded to nope my way home promptly. No 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 no. That's the part in the horror movie where I squeeze the pillow against my chest and use the edge of my pillow to partially obscure my vision. I couldn't imagine experiencing this eye roll. I feel the need to grab a pillow just reading this story. I work at the Discovery Channel telescope in the middle of the Coconino National Forest. A typical night is usually myself, the telescope operator, and an astronomer. One night, during hunting season, we had a curious elk that was wandering around the security fence perimeter. We could hear it bugle over the audio feed from the observation deck and hear it crunching around when we went outside. This lasted for about 30 minutes before it finally wandered off. About an hour later we heard several gunshots nearby. Bad because there is no hunting for 1.5 miles around the facility. Sign are posted everywhere. Given that the astronomer that night was taking long exposure, 2 hours each image, I decided to go walk around the inside perimeter of the security fence. I had my red LED headlamp on and kept seeing the glistening eyes of elk all around the facility. Seemed to me like they were wanting to come in to hide from the hunteress. Creepy but not the worst part. Did the same thing about an hour later. Walk the inner perimeter and looked for the eyes. They were all gone. Right as I'm about to head back in I hear someone clear their throat. Standing at the entrance to the facility. Other side of fence. This dude simply ask you seen dem elk round here. I've been watching em come up the hill. Really need some elk. I informed him that I haven't seen them but he called me a liar and said I was protecting them. He sat there at the gate till twilight then wandered off into the woods. Told the forest service about it the next day and they said they've had reports of a man going onto people's property and stalking prey. Even going as far as hanging out on their porches. We now have IR cameras outside the observatory and heavy duty security features on the entrances because of the weirdo. Oh heck no. That hits too close to home. I regularly camp alone in Coconino and it's creepy enough already. I have a workspace is an old former madhouse, built by monks, which had been turned into a hospital for SS personnel in World War II. Lots of spooky history, a huge building with long hallways and a stern 1920s architecture, brick archways, ugly sculptures of dead monks. I usually work late, until 3 in the morning, and I am usually the last person to leave the building. One night in winter, I locked my room and went to the exit, all the lights were off. The wind was howling. Suddenly I heard the sound of running footsteps in the distance. Lots of running footsteps. And then it was quiet again. 
I went down some stairs and there I saw little red lights blinking on the other side of a long dark hallway, just for a moment, then they were gone. I was pretty freaked out at this point. I walked faster in the direction of the exit, then I heard those running footsteps again. I turned a corner and suddenly a bunch of kids were screaming in my face. Almost had a heart attack. Turned out the kids were playing loser tag. They borrowed the keys to the building from one of their parents. They had these loser guns with red lights to shoot each other with and were chasing each other through the dark building. They thought the building was deserted and almost crap themselves when this big guy in a trench coat suddenly appeared in front of them. Somewhere some kids are telling this story from the opposite point of view. Worked overnights as a master control operator in my youth. One night, around 3am I catch sight of the camera we have aimed at the back door and there's someone standing there wearing a scream mask staring at the camera and not moving. I go to the back door magnetic sealed and a deadbolt for overnight. Door is next to impossible to force open. And look out the peephole and there's no one there. Head back to control and see them walk back into frame. Wave at the camera and then walk away. Call the cops. They found nothing and the camera doesn't record. Live feed only. Dang it that's the job I have now. I keep an eye on the security cameras all night. Sometimes I see a guy appear out of the bushes then walk off camera into the darkness. Last week a disheveled guy came running into our parking lot. Ran in a confused circle. Then went back the way he came. In all my years as a locksmith I've been in plenty of uncomfortable situations. Domestic disputes. Business breakups. I still hate Fridays even though I've been retired from locksmithing for 5 years because of all the jobs I had to do locking fired employees out. I've been in plenty of places someone would tell me was haunted. I would just think they were nuts and go about doing my job as fast as I could to get away from them. If only one time in 20 years did I ever feel like I was in a haunted place. I spent the first 15 years on the job in Metro Atlanta. I moved to a more rural area in the state for the last 5. This house was probably built in the 1930s. All brick. Directly next to a main road. Still a 2 lane road mind you just pretty heavily traveled. Lots of traffic. It looked like a plain place. Nothing uncanny about it from the exterior although the overgrown shrubs and trees gave it weird shadowy places that I took no notice of at first. Inside the house was completely different. It seemed to be refashioned at multiple times but nothing ever tied together. It had an odd angular feel to it. Walking into that place you could feel the air change. With every door open it felt like air didn't move at all. Usually in my work slamming doors were a constant. I'm standing at one door. Someone else opens a door in the house and interior door slam because of the pressure change. Unblocked interior doors did not do that in this place. I walked into the kitchen and nearly scared a carpenter to death. Frick I can't wait to get out of this house, he says. You'll see what I mean. He gathered his crap and left before I got back to my van with all the lock cylinders. From the moment I walked back into that house I felt like I was being watched. It was silent. And several times I felt like something was reaching for me. That electric tingle you get watching someone slowly move their hand to your body. I went into overdrive and hauled butt as fast as I could. Job done. The funny thing was I had probably passed that place a thousand times. Like I said it was a heavily traveled main road. It was in an isolated stretch and not only had I never noticed it I realized passing it a few weeks later that even though it was obviously there and easy to see I still managed to overlook it when I was watching for it. It's like the place didn't want to be seen. A couple of months later I get back to the shop and noticed a co-worker had been there that day. This guy was a former marine gym rat and as tough as they come. He comes in later and we are bullshitting around and then I ask him what he thought of that house. He made a face like I asked him about his worst memory and said that was the creepiest house he'd ever been in. I just let it go. But I also never went back there. This might be the creepiest of them all. There's a Stephen King novel, Black House, which is sequel to another novel, The Talisman, that features a house that doesn't want to be seen, Creeporama. I was working in Antarctica at a station with an elephant seal molting ground. I thought I had left something in a shipping container by the docks, next to the elephant seals. Mindful of my safety and being a bit lazy I grabbed a ute and drove down there at midnight. I parked and left the vehicle running with the lights on. As soon as I got out I realized it was seriously dark. No moon, no building lights, 
can't see your hand in front of your face dark. I hear heavy breathing coming from all around me, and I can hear the two ton bastards starting to move. Whatever I forgot waited until the next day. Oh the moon was out alright. There were just that many seals. This happened a few years ago when I was working at a car dealership. Our business had just moved into a new lot down the road and the cars were parked in an open air parking garage. One way in and one way out with one set of stairs which was right by the entrance. So I'm hanging out at the entrance and I hear a car door slam. I found it strange since no cars had driven in and no one had gone up the stairs. So I start walking up the stairs and I hear another door slam shut. I'm thinking WTF is happening. Next day I tell my co-workers what happened and they all think I'm just delusional. Fast forward a week later, I had to travel down the road to another dealership to pick up some parts. Dealership I went to had just moved out from where my company had moved in. I walk down to the parts department and grab my part. As I'm walking away the guy behind the counter asks if I've worked the night shift yet at our new place. I told him I had and he quickly responded with be safe, that place is haunted. I immediately got goosebumps and proceeded to tell him what I had experienced just a week prior. He said it was normal and you get used to it. Freaked me the frick out. I work as a one to one in a hospital. Pretty much just watch to make sure the PT doesn't rip out their tubes. And I was working nights. So it's basically a patient and myself in a dark room. One night I was with a patient in a double room but the other bed was empty. Though I couldn't see the other bed because a curtain divided to the beds for privacy. Middle of the night the nurse came in and asked if I needed anything cause my call bell light was on. I then told her that I never pressed the button and it turned out it was the bell from the empty bed. The nurse just said oh that's creepy and just left. I was freaked out the rest of the night lol. LOL I woulda been like B you ain't leaving me in here with some creepy crap going on. I used to work as a night janitor at a student union. Skirting tables for events was part of the gig. I was scanning my floor for what needed to be done that night and went into a room annex. Long thin room with one wall entirely made of glass facing the river. I approach a skirted table that's against the glad wall and hear snoring. Sounds funny though. I think it's on my radio. Assume someone feel asleep at work and rolled on the talk button. Standing there for a few seconds trying to figure it out I realize there's a homeless man sleeping under the table. His snoring was climbing the glass window and bouncing off the ceiling that's why I couldn't figure out when the sound was coming from. If you've ever thought you were completely alone only to find out you're within arm's distance from another a person your body becomes one big goosebump and your butthole puckers tighter than a dolphin's. It was freaky. How do you, like, how do you know how tight that is? Isolation in dark room for one day and one night. Woke up at night with an illuminated shadowy figure at the foot of my bed and then it disappeared. I know it's a hallucination though cause there was no light for it to happen. I work nights in a large warehouse like store. It's just me and two others in the store at any given time. We used to have buttons all over the store that would page for help for our customers. I've been working at this location for 5 years and the supervisor for 3 of those years. Once a year we will have. One go off. These things are not plugged in at all. Removed from the system in my first 3 weeks. They still go off sometimes. That one is more than likely a crossed wire somewhere in the building. The disconnected one has an exposed wire that is touching another live exposed wire and is sending the signal as though the disconnected one is active. It goes off because it thinks the circuit is completed. Like it would when the button on the other end is pressed. I was photographing a waterfall in a deep basin. I was the only one in the basin. I was alone from 6pm to 10.30pm. The trail that comes in was right up against a rock face that was straight up and over 400 feet high. When I was heading back up there was bare wet human footprints up the stones of the trail. I got to a spot where I seen muddy footprints leading into the brush. A few moments later I heard a blood curdling scream from the same bushes. The sound to me sounded like a mountain lion. They are common in the area. I ran faster than I've ever ran before. I called rangers to my mile marker and I've checked back since then. No missing persons reports have been filed, nor was anyone's car in that area that night. Easily one of the scariest experiences I've had. That's a pretty common Sasquatch encounter. I was working in a SIF. 
a secure, electromagnetically shielded and soundproof room for doing high security work. Such facilities have extremely strict and onerous rules for entry and exit, so basically you only go in if you have to and there are two person rules that make it desirable for you to stay in if there are few people inside. One day, after being cooped up inside for hours, we exited the SIF. The halls of the building were completely empty, other labs were completely empty, the break room was completely empty, it was zombie movie Twilight Zone creepy, freaking out. We went to another order of the building which had windows. Outside we saw a blizzard with over a foot of snow on the ground and a massive amount still coming down. And my roommate, having his car pushed through the snow to exit the orking lot. The same roommate I had couple to work with. This was before cell phones, so I bolted down the steps and out to the parking lot, in dress shoes, and barely caught him before he drove away. I spent some time in a monetized room with nothing but a mattress and a toilet in there, officially in a psych ward for troubled teens but that was more like prison. After two days already of just laying there on the mattress you just feel how you lose your mind. You feel that paranoia cause everything you do is on camera, pointing straight down at you while sleeping, while taking a crap. That's was when you realize that you can actually lose your mind, is when you will appreciate sanity. Worked overnights at two different 24HR residential treatment centers for teens, aka poltergeist soup. We, staff and clients, would see and hear things people during the middle of the night, almost every night. I remember when I worked at a drug and alcohol rehab facility, it used to be a nunnery attached to a church. I used to hear women singing through our speaker that communicated with our doorbell for visiting hours. I could see through the window of the door from where I would be sitting, and there was never anything there. I have a bunch more. Those places were full of weird crap. My current job is not exactly physically isolating, but more of socially isolating. I'm working as a caretaker for a home full of disabled adults. I'm the night shift, and my job is to do some cleaning and make sure things go smoothly while the clients are sleeping. My job is about 8 hours of nothing all night. Followed by a few hours of cleaning in the morning and helping clients get ready for their day program work. In the last few months, we've had some strange stuff happen. 1. One night, I heard what sounded like a person crying in one of the client's rooms, only to find out they were asleep. They don't have a TV in their room, either, so I'm not sure what the noise could have come from. The next shift, while talking to one of the day staff before they left for the night, they told me about how the day before... After his clients had gone to bed, and just before I had arrived, he had heard someone walk from the garage, through the house, and into the room he was in. He turned around from what he was doing to talk to who he had assumed was a manager showing up to grab something, but no one was there. He said he searched the house, but never found anyone. Cool. 2. We have a non-verbal client, who has a lot of dolls and toys in her room. The other day, when I came into her room to wake her up, she had a new doll lying in bed with her, and she kept rolling on it or pressing on it while getting out of bed, and it would make that awful, baby doll laughter noise. I knew right away I was not a fan of this doll. Later, at the very end of my shift, the day staff arrived and drove all the clients to their day program. I was alone in the house again, and went to clean up any mess left in the clients rooms. I start cleaning the non-verbal clients room and see the baby doll sitting on a chair in the other corner. I start to clean. From across the room, it begins laughing. I say out loud nope. Stop that, it stops, and starts laughing a few seconds later. I say, in as firm a voice as I can manage I'm not gonna put up with this crap, and walk over, open it up, and switch off the battery pack. 3. Just this week, I'm in the kitchen at the start of my shift and keep seeing, from my peripherals, what appears to be a small dog in the hallway, but I see it maybe four times. Usually, I figure things like that are my imagination, and this is no exception, but four times is a lot, so I go and check it out. No dog. About an hour later, I'm in the garage and talking on the phone with someone. It's about midnight, and they haven't gone to sleep yet. There's a pause while talking. When they say what was that I, as calmly as I can, say he up, what they respond it sounded like a dog panting into the phone, now I am spooked, but, trying not to seem like a total weirdo, I just say hi, no, I didn't hear that, we get off the phone very soon after, 
and I go sit in the house with the lights on. You should look more into the meaning of the dog. I don't know why that gives me such a bad feeling but it does. I've been working in my trade for about 20 years. It can be difficult to focus when all the young bucks are asking you questions and blaring terrible music. So I tend to start work when everyone else leaves for the night. I started hearing sounds upstairs like people talking walking opening doors. I dismissed it as my imagination for a few days, but it got to be too much to ignore. So I started investigating when I would hear things. Never found anything. Thought I was going crazy. Turns out, one of the guys that lived near the shop made a hidey hole nest up in the attic to hide from his girlfriend like some kinda dumb but phantom of the opera. Dumb but phantom of the opera got a big laugh from me. Perfect. Thanks. I was working two jobs on Black Friday and after my first job at the mall was over, 12am to 6am, I headed to my other job. It was at a local bead shop in an old house. It was still dark when I got there and we didn't open until 10 so I went inside to go sleep on the futon upstairs for a couple hours. When I opened the back door I could see the silhouette of a person standing in the back room. They were about 20 feet away from me but the street light was shining in through the window behind them and I could see it perfectly. I froze for a couple seconds thinking someone had broken and then flipped on the light by the door. The silhouette vanished as soon as the light came on and I said, oh frick that and went to sleep in my car instead. Shadow people are freaky. I used to work overnight as a dispatcher system monitoring most days we had two people per shift. Pretty much the only reason we wouldn't would be if someone was sick or something. Most nights were completely uneventful basically did nothing for 8 hours. One night around 1am I hear screaming like some girl is getting murdered my co-worker and I both start checking cameras nothing. I grab my radio and start running through the building to find this girl. Ran down to the first floor before I realized it was coming for the back parking lot. I exit the building expecting to have to fight someone with a knife or see a debauchery or some crap. What I actually find is a girl alone in her car just screaming and crying. I find out she just wanted to vent and was seriously okay she thought no one would be in the office park at 1am. I promptly told her to knock it off as it is was absolutely terrifyingly and to please leave. So not really that scary creepy strange at the end of it all but it was absolutely the worst 2 minutes of my life as I was trying to find the screaming. Or, I feel kinda bad for the girl. Poor thing needed a place to vent. To start off, I love listening to true crime podcasts. This summer I worked, by myself, in a greenhouse at my university that was on the top. 9th floor of this building. To even get into the building, you need card access, but to use the elevator you need card access and a key. Over the summer, almost zero people were ever on campus, and especially not up on this floor or even in the building for that matter. After probably 6 hours of working alone on the top floor of this building and listening to creepy murder stories, I was pushing my cart to the elevator, a massive industrial freight elevator, that no one else uses. And I scan my card and wait for the elevator to reach my floor. I can hear it coming. And it's taking a while so I'm still listening to this podcast about some serial killer. Once it's finally at the 9th floor I get ready to open the outer door and happen to peer into the little window and see something inside staring at me through the window. I screamed and jumped back probably 2 feet before I realized it was just another research student coming up to use the greenhouse. Being alone for 6 hours and only hearing scary stories of people getting killed really messes with your nerves lol. Divers and people who spend a lot of time underwater. What's the creepiest most unexplainable thing you've seen while in the depths? When I was a kid we used to go to a place during the summer holiday which had some very nice beaches and in particular an estuary with a very wide river mouth. One summer there was a king tide where enough of the water emptied out of the river into the ocean that you could snorkel quite easily from one side of the river mouth to the other as it got so shallow that it was only a beater or so deep at the deepest part. One day I decided to snorkel across from one beach to the one on the other side of the river, and about halfway across where the depth to the bottom was maybe half a meter. I was swimming along the surface looking down with my mask snorkel on and a massive stingray passed directly underneath me. This thing was easily 2 meters across, covered in white scars and missing its tail. I just froze in the water and it felt like my heart stopped. If I had ever let my breath out, I would have dropped in the water low enough that I would have landed on it, it was so close. 
I wasn't in any danger but having a massive creature appear so unexpectedly, so close up was absolutely terrifying. To clear up some confusion the stinger also gone, just a sort of torn partial stump left of the tail. Something very similar happened to me snorkeling in Hanoma Bay in Oahu, paddling along, having the time of my life, when a massive dark shape emerged in the distance. Before I knew it, it was sailing right under me. I sucked it in because I was afraid it would graze my belly. Turned out to be an absolutely monstrous sea turtle. It was about the size of a mattress. Exhilarating and terrifying. Two biggest. My buddy was taking pictures. He wanted one of me surrounded by a school of fish. So I started tossing out small pieces of hot dog. I was immediately surrounded by so many perch. I couldn't see out. All of a sudden. A bass snagged one of the pieces of hot dog that was maybe 6 inches from my face. My mask blocked his approach. Scared the crap out of me. Second one was a night dive in very silty water. Visibility was less than 3 featuring lowest eye mark. If I can't see my outstretched arm, it is less than 3 feet. We were near a flooded structure, maybe an old water tank. At about 35 feet, something was flashing from our lights. Suddenly, I'm covered in something and I couldn't see my light reflecting back. I pull it off my face, but it is still black and I can feel it touching the top of my head. I try over and over to free myself, but I don't feel caught, just covered. Finally, I get clear. It was a large plastic trash bag. Keep your trash out of the water, please. One of our assistant instructors got bit on the head and dragged 5 featuring or so by a bass at casino point while feeding the fish peas on our safety stop. He came out bleeding from his head and everyone thought he hit his head on the reef. On a night dive in Scripps Canyon a cormorant rammed directly into my dive light at high speed and knocked itself unconscious. I thought it was dead but gently brought it back to the surface where it woke up and took off. As much of a shock that must have been this made me laugh. And that you helped an injured bird made me aww. Got charged by a mother humpback. Her curious calf had swum around us and we were between her and the calf. Two of us never saw it coming. We were watching the baby. But our third diver watched her come. She kicked down and swam under us last minute. We didn't see anything until that 60 feet freight train passed just underneath us. You just narrowly avoided getting finding nemo Rescue recovery diver here. Every time I've recovered a drowning victim I get the creeps. Unfortunately a lot of people are under the impression that every underwater environment is like the movies and there's absolute clarity. That's rarely the case. One evening I got called out for a young girl that jumped from a bridge. She likely survived the fall and entry. We have a morbid term for what happened to her upon hitting the water. Plugged. I found her with a surprising amount of visibility in relatively shallow water. She was stuck in the mud to just below her knees, and you could see the fear locked into her eyes face. There's nothing peaceful about suicide by bridge. I dropped my goggles and was trying to reach down in the river and grab it but I pulled out a sheep skull by its sockets. Wasn't as creepy in hindsight but 10 year old me was scared. Wasn't as creepy in hindsight my butt. I got told a story once by a Maori language teacher of mine during my time at high school. We didn't learn much Maori, just listened to stories. A dam in the Waikato, New Zealand had begun to have visible cracks in the concrete on the outside part of the dam and some drivers were organized to dive down and check the inside submerged part of the dam for damage on that side. While they were down there, there was the usual debris you would find behind a man-made wall which prevents the water from flowing as it would normally do if there wasn't a dam there. Turns out what they thought were large logs were in fact huge eels which had gotten to the size of logs due to being prevented from migrating to the sea, where they breed and die. So from being prevented from doing their natural life duties they just get larger and larger. That would be creepy seeing eels deep down in the water just floating around. The shrieking eels from the princess bride are the most terrifying thing ever to me. That fear has stuck into my adult life because no one has ever been able to tell me if they were fake or real eels used in the filming. My brain just can't deal with eels. You can dive in man-made lakes and check out what's left of old flooded homes and communities. It's pretty dark and spooky down there no matter what. Especially when you think of all the big fish swimming around that are barely silhouettes until they are close. My buddy likes to dive in lakes. He said the creepiest thing. 
by far, is Finding Cemeteries 100 featuring and beneath the water in the dark, eerie quiet. I asked him about big fish. He said there's definitely crap down there bigger than he expected 4 or 5 feet. They're attracted to the lights and noise but watch from a distance, which is nonetheless disinciting. Just dark. 2D shapes drifting nearby. None of the monsters other folks are bringing up though. Someone just dove to the bottom of our lake to check a drain and now he won't go back under cause he said he saw a fish that could swallow him whole lol. 20 plus feet long he said. I had a dive master that told me once he was diving somewhere and found a full skeleton wearing diving gear with the air on the tank turned off pretty deep down. If I remember correctly they said they reported it to the police and it was found out the man's wife turned off his air while they were on a dive to murder him. A co-worker of mine goes cave diving and says that while not super common, you do find dead bodies in swim gear in caves sometimes. People either go too far into the cave and then run out of oxygen on the way back, or they squeeze past a tight gap and get stuck on the other side, unable to come back the way they came. I dive myself but heard this story from a Garda diver. In 2010 a man took a test drive in a car with a salesman and in a suicide attempt he drove the car off the pier into the sea and drowned. The salesman managed to escape my breaking the window and swimming to the surface. The divers were dispatched to retrieve the other man's body. This isn't in the news report which I have a link to below for anyone interested. Simply through working in marinas at the time I was able to be part of the conversation with the diver in question. When he got to the car, he said, the man was still facing forward, hands on the steering wheel, eyes wide. He'd been there a couple of hours now, where it gets creepy is when the diver opened the driver door. This combined with the smashed window caused the currents to flow through the car and the man's wide-eyed head turned around slowly with the force of it to face the diver. When living off the coast some buddies and I would take regular fishing trips out to the oil rigs. We would always have some lines out and a few would dive down and try to spear some mangrove snapper or cobia. Once while I and two others were diving down checking out the structure we decided we needed to move due to lack of life around the rig. We all get back in the boat and as one of my buddies is reeling in a line we had a red snapper baited on. An easily 8-10 feet tiger shark starts chewing on it right behind the prop. So close I could have poked his eye out. The idea that massive animal was in the water so close to me and two of my friends but no one saw it is terrifying. I bet he was watching us the whole time. I bet he was watching us the whole time. And that's why you didn't see any other fish in the area. Not unexplainable, but gave thee a bit of a fright. I worked as a commercial diver for about 7 years in the UK and also some work in Europe. I was working in Orkney, north of Scotland, on the fish farms. One time I swam down one of the bigger nets off Rouse and it was very dark, very overgrown, and I could see some weird shapes lying in the dead man's sock as I descended. There were a few more dead fish than usual, maybe a hundred or so, but underneath them were lying three dead seals. Big ones. It was hard to make out because they were covered in fish but one of the seals had a big freaking chunk of it missing. And that's when I looked up and saw a 4 foot tear in the side of the net. Frick that. I was only a newbie at this point. Fish farm work is generally the best way to start a diving career. Doesn't pay the best but you get plenty of minutes logged which helps for experience. I told the supervisor who said get out straight away. They sent one of the more experienced lads in after me and he fixed the whole sharpish and then rigged the seals up to be lifted out. Turns out the seals had been killed by orca and somehow got through the net in a panic. Orca are quite common up in Orkney and are the only animal we were told you had to get out the water for if seen. Only one of the seals had a bite mark. The other two got caught in the net. Not supernatural or anything but I remember a significant shiver running down my spine that day. Why Orcus? I was told by one of the marine environment lads who used to regularly come out on the boats with us. That it's a precautionary thing. Wearing black neoprene and fins you may be mistaken for a seal and become breakfast. To be fair, it's a precaution I was very happy to go along with. We don't get great whites or tiger sharks up here, but I'd imagine in South Africa, India, Australia etc there would be similar rules. It's disconcerting being reminded that you are not the apex predator in the vicinity. 
An old World War II ammunition ship off the south coast of England was full of brass topped shells. Most had been taken by divers over the years and it was now very rare to see them, apart from a pile in one corner of the ship. This pile of shiny brass metals was miraculous and touched and remarkably clean after spending years underwater and you only found out why if you swam near then. Out of the murky darkness the largest eel I have ever seen snakes forward. Without exaggeration this thing had a head the same size as a horse's head, full of jagged teeth. I could not see the body as it looped into the dark and deeper into the ship. No one got near those shells. Turns out for years this thing had been guarding the shiny brass shells, slithering over them making them shine. We found out at the bar later that he was famous in the area and many people went to the wreck just to see him. No idea why this giant creature was guarding them like a dragon and its horde, but some said eels are like magpies and like shiny things. It has been pointed out it was probably a conger eel not a murray. I'm honestly not sure as it was years ago and very dark. I have updated accordingly. When I was a kid swimming in the lake at summer camp, I dove underwater and I swear I saw someone in scuba gear hiding underneath the dock watching us. I told the lifeguard, but he wasn't able to find anyone. I'm a commercial diver, and was once on a job cleaning a potable water reservoir. I'd been in other reservoirs before, but this was by far the biggest, at 40x80 meters. To get in you had to open a hatch in the ground. The whole reservoir was underground, and climbed down a ladder. The hatch was in a corner, so when you were in the far corner of the reservoir, it was completely pitch black, and you just had to hope your light didn't go out. I was about halfway through a 3 hour dive when the batteries in my torch started going flat. I watched the beam get narrower and dimmer until it cut out completely. It's not a huge problem if you lose light, as you can just follow your umbilical back to the hatch. Just as I started walking back, some obnoxiously loud banging started somewhere in the reservoir. I was the only diver in there, so it both confused and scared the crap out of me. Needless to say I ran back to the hatch as fast as I could. I ended up getting my torch changed out and doing another hour in the water, but didn't hear the noise again. I still have no idea what it was, but the combination of my torch going out and loud banging coming from somewhere gave me a heck of a fright. Oh, his light is going out. I better bang on the ladder so he knows where it is. This isn't my story but my dad's. So when he was in grad school he did some field studies classes some of which involved diving in Monterey Bay. One day he was diving counting something off of the Santa Cruz pier and he finds a shopping cart with bricks and cinder blocks and a chain attached to the handle. He naturally followed the chain and found a bare foot wrapped in the chain. He assumed something probably ate the rest of the body and apparently his friends had seen similar things too. Also not mine but my dad's friend. He says he was on a shelf counting muscles when he felt something tap his tank and he looked around and didn't see anything. He figured it was a seal cause they liked to play. When he was nudged again he saw it was a great white. He says he thought to himself if it gets me it gets me I can't outswim it. Now I don't know if he was actually that chill I sure wouldn't be but that's how he tells it. I used to teach canoeing lessons to boy scout troops at a local neighborhood lake. Super small lake that's not very deep but the bottom was hella thick with vegetation. The water was dark so you couldn't see your hands in front of you for more than like 5 inches under the surface. There was a small clubhouse, an open pavilion, and a playground all on the property. When doing lifeguard work in the water during a swim test, my sunglasses fell off my head. I dove down to find them and crap you not. I found a sunken, entangled hospital gurney at the bottom of the lake. It took a few people to untangle it but how the eff it got there was beyond me. Clearly it had been under the water for years. I've done a number of dives, and the strangest thing I ever saw was a large deep freezer with a heavy industrial chain wrapped around multiple times with about 5 cinder blocks attached. It was very very rusted and the deep freezer itself had to have been 30 plus years old, probably more. This was about 90 feet deep just off Vancouver Island, Canada. The situation gave myself and the other divers the new BGBs, logged the GPS and depth coordinates and notified the police. We were able to find out what was inside, since one of the divers had friends with local police. 10 porcelain dolls. Nice work. You have unleashed them from the watery prison that was protecting us all from their wrath. When I used to surf I spent a good deal of time underwater, whether intentional or not. 
One day, I went out in surf that was absolutely massive, for me. It was 10 foot solid all day, bigger sets, serious stuff, and it was a very dark, overcast winter's day, and raining. You couldn't see crap above the water, let alone below. At this place, the bigger it gets, the further out on the rock shelf it breaks. So I was at least 200 meters from shore when out of the gloom towered an absolutely massive set. Enormous. As big as I'd ever encountered. There were only a handful of other blokes out there. The wave was mine. At this point I wasn't scared at all. No. I wanted to get the biggest wave of my life. So I tried. I got onto it but I just fricked up the position of my feet. Ever so slightly. No chance of pulling out. So I tried to go with it. And that is when it happened. The scariest freaking water based experience I ever had. I fell off and this thing just took me to town. It lifted me all the way up and over the falls. I thought I was okay. But no. It was just beginning. It just kept pushing me down. Further and further. My ears hurt. Badly. It was completely dark. Cold. Even in a wetsuit. I came to rest on what seemed to be a very large. Smooth rock I could feel it with my fingers whilst I was pinned firmly to it. I was held there for what seemed like an eternity. Maybe 10 seconds. But then I could sense with my feet a ferocious current that seemed to stop at the edge of the rock. It was trying to pull me over the ledge and down. I could hear it. At this point I was panicking. Seriously. I can't quite remember how I escaped. I have rarely been that scared in all my life. I made it to the surface. I really thought I was going to pass out. I can't remember much more but I must have paddled in so freaking fast other people noticed. They came to see what was the matter. I just sat on the beach. I could not even talk. I'm getting the freaking heebie jeebies even reading my own recollection. I've been pinned down before, but only by soft, relatively forgiving southern CA waves. Even the punishment dealt by the 1983 El Nino waves never had me hearing the hand of Poseidon. God, that's a terrifying thought. First time diving on Australia and first time diving with sharks. We start descending and the guide is at the front of the group looking for the sharkies. I'm at the back of the group. Suddenly I turn my head left and there's this 6 foot mf about a foot or two from my face. He just swam peacefully past the group. It was a bit creepy but lots of fun. He just wanted you in their school. I used to do a lot of night dives hunting for lobster off the coast of California. We'd start at 9 or 10 at night so everything is obviously pitch black besides where we were pointing our lights. Every so often I'd get this unshakable feeling that something big was watching or following me. Sometimes I could quiet that part of my brain and continue with the dive. Other times I couldn't shake the feeling and would end the dive after a few minutes. It's a hard feeling to describe but I guess I'd compare it to being in a haunted house but 50 feet underwater in complete darkness. My mom used to dive a lot, Florida Caribbean though, and she told me she used to get the same feeling on night dives sometimes. Not sure if it helps you or not, but she said on multiple occasions it turned out to be a barracuda hanging out over her shoulder using her light to see. Not a diver. It heard from old divers that worked for the Corps of Engineers that there's some huge catfish around the bottom of the dams, like the size of ants. There was a pretty cool show called River Monsters on Animal Planet a while back with a dude that would go around looking for giant fish that ate people. He caught a 5 foot long 161 pounds catfish in India once. I once went diving at Port Elizabeth. South Africa where it is quite popular to see sharks. We begin diving and we are quite far from the shore. There's a cool looking structure under us. We swim towards it to get a closer look and I just start getting this cold 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 feeling running through my body. And that's when a shark appeared and I physically shat myself from fear. Not a diver but, when I was surfing NZ's west coast beach I felt something wrap around my leg so I looked down and it was fishing line so I tried to pull it up and then the line got heavy. I assumed it was a fish. But as I pulled the line closer it got really heavy and I began to sink so I hoped on my board and paddled closer to shore. I slid off my board and was in chest deep water. My friend came over cause he noticed something was wrong. We both pulled the fishing line in and we saw a large silhouette in the water so we dragged it to the surface and it was a dead body. Someone rock fishing fell off the rocks last week and was missing. There was a hook stabbed into his neck and fishing line wrapped around his face and dug into his skin. 
We brought the dude's body to the shore and called in the lifeguards then threw up due to the lack of his eyes. This was a really interesting read, sorry you had to see that, but thanks for sharing. I find the chance of that fishing line wrapping around your leg fascinating. You had to be in a certain place, at a certain moment, as the water moved in a particular way to connect that line to you. My dad is a diver and once he found a dead person that was deemed missing for quite a while. The guy was fishing with a harpoon. I'm not a natural English speaker so I can't use the correct term. And his harpoon was stuck inside the skull of a huge bass. He probably died because he didn't measure his breath correctly and the bass didn't die immediately so he actually fought back and became the harpoon was connected in the belt of the guy's belt he couldn't escape in time so he drowned. Point is my dad discovered a half decomposed body of a dead person floating like a horrifying flesh balloon. Have a nice day. I feel terrible that your last sentence made me laugh so hard. I have 150 plus dive but can't say I've seen anything all that creepy. But I do have a cool dive story to share. I was diving the blue hole in Belize and we were at max depth which is 120 feet. It gets weird at that depth. The light level is getting pretty low and it feels oppressive. You realize you're way down. There are some lemon sharks that swim around the blue hole. They are curious and like to check out divers, but they are harmless. They look mean as heck though and can get 8-9 feet easily. At 120 feet one of them decided to come check out me and my, now ex, wife. She was a bit in front of me but when she saw the shark beelining towards us she quickly swam behind me and shoved me towards the shark. I was not expecting that and it took a minute to process what happened, but I felt bad for her more than anything. She was terrified for a few seconds. I laughed about it later and said at least I knew where I stood with her. She is a good diver but the sight of that 8 foot shark swimming straight at her with a mouth full of teeth triggered her survival instincts. I didn't hold it against her, as I got shoved towards the shark, who was at that point only about 6 feet away from me. He calmly turned to the side and glided right past me and then went on to check out some other divers. We started our ascent and I didn't see him again. It was a very cool experience. Didn't hold it against her now ex-wife. MHMM. What's your creepiest glitch in the matrix or unexplainable thing that's ever happened to you? Taking the trash out at night. Super remote area so I know for a fact we're the only ones around here. Getting close to the road and I hear very clearly help me from a female voice. Even knowing there's such a slim chance of there being another living person around. I still feel like I should look around and check it out in case I wasn't just hearing things and someone actually needs help. Take about two steps in the direction I thought I heard it. Hear a giggle in the same exact voice. Turn around and walk promptly back up the driveway because frick that crap. Anyone who actually needed help wouldn't be laughing. I don't think. I like that you had to be specific that a living person would be a rarity near you. I was about 12 years old, and woke up in the middle of the night needing to take a leak. I walked across the hall to the little bathroom, hit the lights, and was about to reach for the toilet when I glanced up and saw a face in the mirror. It was not my face. It was as if someone was on the other side, standing to the right, with their face right next to the glass, staring at me. I only saw it for the briefest moment, but it is seared into my brain. I screamed, and ran out of there to find my dad. Of course, my dad investigated, then calmed me down, or tried to. Eventually we had a prayer session, because I was so freaked out. Eventually I must have gone back to sleep. Fast forward to my 30s, I'd forgotten all about the event. One night while visiting, my dad quietly brings it up. Remember that one time you saw a face in the mirror? It suddenly came back to me in a rush of memory, sending a chill down my spine. Yay. I remember. Well, he said, I sometimes think about that night. He looked down at the floor, with a serious expression. I saw it too. He went on to describe exactly what I'd seen. We have no idea what that was. Apparently when he investigated, he saw it and had a freak out of his own. Apparently the prayer session was as much for his own nerves as mine. I respect him for keeping that tidbit from me till my 30s, but I kinda wish he'd never told me. So, this might be hard to explain. I was probably 12, and lived in a big log cabin. One day while my parents were at work, I got in a fight with my brother, 18, who had some anger issues. 
He chased me through the house and I ran out one door, around our porch and in through another door. I was going to lock it behind me but didn't have time because he was too close behind me. So, I slammed the door behind me and kept running. When I glanced back to see if he had made it through the door yet, he was banging on the window of said door and yelling for me to unlock it. The door was locked and there was no he had locked it, because the door could only be locked from the outside with a key of course, and our parents never gave us keys. There was also no way the door could have accidentally locked when I slammed it behind me, because it needed to be fully turned to lock, and usually required some finagling at the end to make it actually lock. I stood there dumbfounded for a few seconds and then ran to a bathroom and locked myself in there. Definitely feel that saved me that day. The door only had a deadbolt, which could only be locked from the outside with a key, but from the inside you had to turn the knob. Suppose I worded that in a confusing way. This didn't happen to me, but to my mother and aunt when they were younger, and to this day is the creepiest thing I've ever heard. So one day when they were around 16 years old they were alone in the house for a couple of hours while their mother was out working. I don't remember exactly which one of them noticed this but one of them walked into the kitchen and was shocked to find that the stove had somehow been ripped open all the way into the oven. My mother described it as if someone had stabbed the top of the oven, slashed it, and then pulled that slash open with their hands. Both of them saw it and when I asked my aunt about this story she gave me the same description. Also, this was definitely not a visual hallucination because they swear they reached with their hand from inside the oven to the top through the hole. They both swear they were sober at the time and I believe them because they were raised in an extremely religious environment so it's impossible they were drunk or high. When my grandmother got home they naturally went to show her the slash only to find it was completely gone. The stove was completely normal and there was no sign of a hole ever being there. This experience is probably the only reason why I'm not completely skeptical about the supernatural. I've got other personal experiences of this sort but they all can be explained rationally one way or another in a way that makes complete sense. But this story is way beyond me. Okay my sister and I were playing the age old game of get the frick out of my room. If you've never played it before. All you do is try to get the intruder out. I managed to get her outside the door, but she always trying to push it open while I was attempting to close it. Suddenly, I slam it shut, meaning I won. I turn around and there is my very confused sister wondering how she ended up back in my room. In her confusion, I managed to get her back out. I love how getting her out was still the priority even though she just inexplicably appeared in your room. For obvious reasons I always keep a reverse Uno card in my pocket, a blue reverse Uno card which I once found on my nightstand. Anyways, I had accidentally washed it with my pants, it was destroyed. The next day after waking up, guess what I found on my nightstand? A blue Uno reverse card. You better prepare to be washed at some point. You wash the reverse card, now the reverse card will wash you. My dad's story. SP we spent a lot of time growing up by a local creek fishing in my family. My brother and dad were all alone in a meadow around the end of summer and my brother looks at him and says do you remember when I was big and you were little keep in my mind my brother doesn't talk much at all and he would be about 4. My dad was obviously creeped out but was like what buddy and my brother said when I was big and you were little and wouldn't elaborate further. My brother has no clue what he was talking about but apparently we all had a moment like that. All alone with per parents asking if they remember when we were big and they were little. When I was 14, 1995, during the eerie calm before a summer lightning storm, my dog Daisy, Chow Lab Mix, started barking at the corner of the basement. There was nothing to bark at, just stone fireplace and a tile floor. Suddenly a lamp set above the fireplace had the light bulb explode and a painting hung next to it shattering as it flew off the wall at an almost 90 degree trajectory, landing 10 feet from the wall. My brother and I have theorized for years what it was. Our best guess is that lightning hit the chimney and that's what did the damage. We've never been able to figure out how our dog knew it was about to happen. The charge built up and was audible to the dog before the strike. I once went to sleep in a one made bed, cause I'm lazy and was too tired to make it lol. I was laying under the covers and I woke up laying face down sideways on top of a completely made bed. Not me but a buddy of mine, 
We were playing Xbox and we both have Elite controllers which have magnetic joysticks that pop right off so you can switch to another. Well he tossed his on his bed and went to the bathroom. He came back to find his right joystick missing. I let him use mine because I prefer the longer ones. During the summer he texted me saying he found it at his dad's house, 150 miles away from where he regularly hangs his hat, his mom's house. Must have gotten in with some laundry. When I was 5, I was sitting and watching my dad cook. Everything went white for what seemed like a minute and then back to normal. Still sitting upright, my dad still cooking in the kitchen. For years I was convinced I had been abducted by aliens. Of course, 10 years later I was diagnosed with epilepsy, so it was probably just a seizure. I guess what I'm getting at is that any unwilling lapses of consciousness feel kinda like the world crap the bed for a moment. This just happened today. My daughter, 4, was playing in her room on the second story. I was two rooms away, playing my guitar, very loudly. I heard my daughter screaming daddy come to the guest bedroom, I want to show you something this immediately seemed off. We have an extra bedroom, but I had never heard her call it that before. While she also has pretty good speech, this was amazingly clear. When I walked around the corner, into the bedroom to see what she wanted, I saw two little legs sliding out the window. I jumped across the room, and grabbed my daughter by her ankle before she could fall out. After a not great moment where I yelled at her, then hugged her, then yelled again, then apologized for yelling and hugged her. I finally calmed down. We had a talk about why we don't play in windows. While I was putting the window back together, she had pushed and popped out the storm and screen window from the bottom. I asked her what she wanted to show me. What? What do you want to show me? You asked me to come see something. No I didn't daddy. Are you sure? You told me to come to the guest bedroom. I little whiny now, and annoyed. No I didn't daddy. You didn't ask me to come to the guest bedroom to see something? Number. Okay. When I was in high school, I remember reading a question on a test, thinking to myself, why do I already know the exact numeric answer? I'm not even done reading it. Thinking on it for a brief moment, I realized I had literally dreamt this exact question word for word the night before. Only time it's ever happened to me, but to my grave I will swear that it did. Got it right. BTW. My takeaway was delivered to me in 5 minutes. I rang at 9.56pm and it was at my door at 10.01pm. The restaurant is around 4 minutes from my house not including time getting an out of car and the call lasted 3 minutes. I could never justify the possibility of it. My first pair of glasses just disappeared. When I went to bed, I would always put my glasses on my nightstand and really never took them off other than at that time. One day, I put my glasses on the nightstand, woke up in the morning, and they were just gone. I asked my parents and sisters if they moved it, and they all said no. Our whole family turned the house upside down, but couldn't find it. I still don't know where they are, or I could just be an idiot, and left it somewhere, but I severely doubt that I was that stupid. I once had a dream about a woman with blue hair. A few weeks later an identical woman with blue hair told me she had a dream about me recently. I told her the same. We were both like WTF that's weird. I've two that tie together. First when I was like 6 on an Easter Sunday I was at my grandparents catholic church and the priest would always have kind of a story time on the holidays with the kids. He'd have us come and sit all around the front of the church. Now I have a less popular biblical name. I think it is at least and had never heard it said in church before. So I'm playing with a plant on the side of the altar, with empty pews in front of me barely listening. When a lady I hadn't seen and didn't know says M listen to father he's talking about the son you're named after. Afterwards my grandmother was all excited and asked if I'd heard father's lesson involving the son. I told her yay the nice lady on that side of the altar told me he was talking about my name do we know her everyone in the family laughed and said those pews were empty for the entire mass. Story 2. 8 years later I'm getting ready to go stay at the same grandma's house. I left on my bike, with headphones and my CD player turned all the way up, to get books from the library and about a half mile from the house I hear a voice that's familiar but different tell me M you need your helmet on this journey. I listened and rode back to grab my helmet, 
Almost to the library I went across a small side road and looked back at the same time a car started to turn into the road. I slammed my brakes and went over the bars landing on my helmet and the car stopping a foot away from me being underneath. Vehicle behind him was an off duty EMT that called the squad cause he didn't see my helmet when I went over. It took 45 minutes for my dad to get there through the massive traffic jam I caused but the officers and EMTs all agreed that had I not been wearing that helmet I would not have survived that impact with only scrapes and a shattered wrist. I'm convinced that those voices both times were the same entity. I don't know what she is but I'm glad as heck she was there. I've never heard it again but I know I'd be dead or significantly changed if not for that. About 2 years ago I was driving up a short hill in the overtaking lane. I was attempting to overtake a particularly slow car. I was going far too fast. I absolutely knew this but was somehow fine with it. But then I had a burst of adrenaline and decided to accelerate even harder to overtake the car. Before the overtaking lane merged back into one lane. Sometimes I don't think I was successful. I think after I crested the hill I was too abreast in the now single lane. A truck was in the opposite lane starting to come up to the hill and I think I hit it at the right hand side. The truck driver's left side. Straight on. At considerable speed. I remember looking at the truck and thinking I'm going to hit it but feeling that that's okay. Everything is going to be fine. I think I saw the front of the truck hit and crumple the left side of my car. Saw it come right up to my face then. For a second. Nothing but black. A moment later I was parked by a small factory type building about half a mile down the road. I remember my skin feeling prickly and tingly and I felt the adrenaline whoosh out of my body. I cut my journey short and just went home. Now, on occasion things just feel left of center. The world just feels a little more gray and cold and I mean that literally and figuratively. My family and friends seem absolutely the same and I'm very happy in my life but some things in the world just seem off. This seems absolutely ridiculous to say but sometimes I'll be in a place and I'll get an odd, uncomfortable feeling and then the place seems to flash to warmth and sunlight and happiness. It then goes back to this slightly off, grayer place. I see the same physical place but for a while it seems much more beautiful. I'll read an article or listen to the radio and I'll think that that's not how it's supposed to be. So I'll google it and sure enough I was wrong. It's not all the time and it doesn't worry me. As I said my personal life is the same and I'm happy. It's the outside world that sometimes feels so off and so wrong. Something not dissimilar happened to a friend of mine who nearly died in a very well publicized and violent terrorist attack a few years ago but escaped. They were diagnosed with dissociation and PTSD. Almost 5 years ago, my husband passed away very suddenly. I slept on the couch for a few weeks because I couldn't bear to go into the bedroom. One day my best friend called and said she'd had a dream about him. In it, he asked her if I found the letter. She asked me what that meant and I said I didn't know. That week I decided to reclaim my bedroom and pack up some of his things. He was a mess to live with and had piles of clothes all over his side of the bed. As I bagged them up, a small folded piece of paper with my name on it caught my eye. I unfolded it and sure as crap. It was a letter from him. It was written specifically for me to read after he died and in it. He apologized for leaving me the way he did. Here's the kicker. His death wasn't suicide. He was a healthy 28 year old man and died in a way no one could have predicted. I have many more stories of things that have happened around me since his passing and if anyone's interested I'm happy to share. I stopped to tie my shoelace in Amsterdam after I felt someone push my shoulder. The person was not here. A brick feel about a few cm away from my head from the construction above. Someone saved me. I had a paranoid schizophrenic housemate. He had the idea that a local gang with the initials VF was trying to kill him. And so, they were carving VF into walls around our house and he would see VF everywhere. This was all in his mind go. One day, we were sitting at our dinner table, and he was going on one of his rants regarding the VF gang. As I tried to calm him down and tell him that it was all in his mind, he spilled a cup of soda onto the floor accidentally. As we both looked down at the spill, a massive and perfectly shaped formation of the letters V and F could be seen on the floor. It was very hard to keep explaining to him that it was all in his mind once that happened. That was a total mind frick that I couldn't even begin to explain. I was living for 3 summers in a big old house that served as the rectory, church house, for a church where I was working. 
The minister was in and out all summer, and I was also there to house sit while he was on vacation. At the time I was really into sleep tracking apps, and particularly sleep noise recording apps to see if I could hear myself talking in my sleep. I ran it almost every night and never heard a single interesting thing. I barely snore, so I would hear the odd siren outside, the bed creaking as I rolled over, breathing, a fart, etc. One morning when I was alone in the house, minister on vacation, and I opened the app to play back noises from the night before, all the usual stuff until the second to last recording. The recording was from around 3.34 in the morning. You can clearly hear me breathing and that I am not rolling around or moving much. If I had rolled or gotten up the app would have recorded it as it was an old and creaky bed. Suddenly, as you hear me breathing, there comes the noise of three very distinct and unmistakable wraps of knuckles on wood, followed by a two second pause, and the snapping of fingers. Tap, 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 snap. It was super unnerving especially because there was no evidence that it was me doing it. It bothered me enough that I set the phone back down on the nightstand and tried to recreate the noise from anywhere that I could reach while laying on the bed, the frame, the bedside table, the nearby bookcase, but I could never get it exactly or figure out what wood was being tapped on. Whatever the case, the noise was distant enough that it could not have come from anywhere that I could have reached while lying in the bed. I have never been prone to sleepwalking talking, or even getting up in the night to go to the bathroom, so I am quite certain it wasn't me. This is something that has stuck with me and for which I have no answer. Yeah frick that. When I was around 4-8 years old, my older brother had a huge, white stuffed tiger. It must have been at least twice the size of me. For reasons probably related to this incident, I became scared of it one day and would never want to be near it. I would make my brother hide it in the closet at night so I could sleep. Anyway, one day the tiger was on the floor in my parents room. I walked through my parents doorway and immediately spotted the tiger on the right. I stared at it for a few seconds when suddenly the tiger's tail came to life and waved around in the air before patting the floor a few times. It then returned to the spot it was in. It looked exactly how a cat moves their tail. Of course I ran away, screaming, crying, etc. My family insisted I was seeing things, but at the time I had never had a cat and had no idea cats move their tail like that. I have no doubt that tiger moved. I am a heavy equipment mechanic. Went to work on a log skidder in the woods. After I pulled off the main road it was another on a sketchy butt trail to get to the machine. Rolled up to beautiful scene in the woods overlooking a valley. It was gorgeous. Normally I turn up music and get to work. No music today. Didn't want to spoil the wonderful sounds of the forest. I worked around 5 hours or so when I hear someone behind me. Scared the living crap out of me. It was older dude around 75ish I assumed. Khakis. Flannel. Wore out running shoes. We had a wonder conversation. I turned around to continue working. Asked did where he was from over my shoulder. No answer. He vanished. Then I began to think about the closest dwelling I saw. Where he could have been from. I decided he was hiking. Then I remembered what he was wearing. No pack. No hiking stick. Nothing. It really creaked me out. My wife tells me it was an angel. I don't know about that. But it was something for sure. I always seem to glance at a clock with the 11 minutes showing at least 4 times a day. It drive me bananas for some reason. This used to happen to me in school too. Except I always glanced at exactly 9-11 or 11-11. It seemed like a very obvious bad joke, or just something I noticed more just because of the significance of that number. Joking I couldn't go on vacation because every time I did, a war broke out. I finally went on vacation and flew to New Orleans on the 10th of September, 2001. I haven't taken a vacation since. When you retire the world is gonna end or something. I carry the same pen in the same pocket of my scrubs every day. I was doing my thing at work earlier this week. I go to grab my pen and there were two. Colon oh. It's not a big deal and maybe not entirety creepy but it legit rocked my brain and freaked me out. I didn't accidentally pick up another identical pen at some point that morning. Not even possible. Yet there it was. Second pen. WTF. I lived in a shared house while at university, and it was a freaking odd place. Things would go missing in plain sight and then reappear moments later. Not just small things like lighters but big things. Jackets, 
plates, textbooks. We got so used to it we ended up accepting it. Everyone would leave the room for a minute and when you came back in whatever was missing would be right back wherever it last was. The living room had a sliding door that gave access to the hallway. We were poor students so all the radiators in the hallways were always turned off and we only heated the bedrooms and communal lounge. So that door was always closed. Most nights the door would have a good rattle. We were all inner city kids and just put it down to passing buses. Until someone pointed out that we were out that we lived on a residential street. No buses, no trucks and the underground tube trains came nowhere near the place. The neighbors came around one evening and very politely asked us to stop banging up and down the stairs late at night. That caused an uncomfortable moment when we apologized but mentioned we thought it was them banging up their staircase. The weirdest moment was me in bed one night sleeping, waiting for my girlfriend to get back from a night out with her girlfriends. The bedroom door opened, and I felt the bed bow as she climbed in. I could feel the warmth of someone beside me but it didn't feel like a... I rolled over and there was no one there. By this time you just accepted weird stuff happened. It never felt threatening. I am a scientist and an atheist. I don't believe in weird crap. But something was freaking wrong in that house. I sometimes wonder if it was something to do with my girlfriend then a... She was named after an elder sibling who died young. Before a was born. At times she was capable of the weirdest crap. I had long hair back then in the part of London we lived in still had a culture of freak bashing. I remember someone starting to pick a fight with me in the pub one night. He pinned me against a wall and got in a few solid punches when A stopped him in his tracks with a calm statement along the lines of listen. I know your mother left you when you were 6 and your grandmother brought you up. I know she died last month and you are angry, but this isn't going to make you feel better. She loved you, she wouldn't want you to be like this. Woo 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 more stories about the psychic girlfriend please. Was driving home from college and kind of daydreaming during the long drive. I had been doing suspension work on the truck I was driving and suddenly had a vivid picture in my mind of the right front wheel spindle. I imagined a bolt that I had screwed with had shaken loose and the tire became completely uncontrollable. In my imagination the tire deflected fully to the right and immediately threw the nose of my truck around and the whole vehicle started rolling maybe a dozen times. On the highway in the middle of nowhere it would have taken a long time for an ambulance to reach me if I needed it. Since I was seat belted I would probably survive if this happened. Lo and behold, as I come over the next rise I see a truck on the side of the road. Tire marks in my lane. People pulled over running to the overturned truck. And one tire fully canted out. Just. Like. I. Imagined. The real kicker is that I think it happened at the same time I imagined it. I didn't connect the dots until I was already past the accident. I will always regret not stopping. TL. DR. My imagination caused a horrible one car wreck. I was about 16 when this happened in Chicago. My friend was driving and we were in the alley heading to her garage. Two small ostriches darted in front of the car. We freaked out and chased them, but ultimately lost them when they ran into a yard. We even got out to look for them. When we told her parents, they accused us of being high, we weren't, and they still give us crap about it to this day. Honestly, after going over it in my head a bunch, I don't even know what we actually saw. I'm not superstitious but there's this one thing. My lucky numbers are 317. And then my daughter was born on the 17th of March. 3 stroke 17. And then after I got divorced and was nervous to start a new life I ended up getting this awesome apartment and guess what number it was 317. Honestly knowing that it felt like my daughter saying you're gonna be okay made my new start okay. One night. Me and a buddy got stuck at a house party with no ride home, so we had to walk 15 miles home. As we walked, we lamented the fact that we didn't have any cigarettes and all of the stores we passed by were closed. After a while, we found a pack of Marlboro lights on the curb with 17 cigarettes left. And a few miles later we found another pack of Marlboro lights on the curb with 17 cigarettes left. What are the odds of finding two packs of the same brand? with the same number of cigarettes, while walking down the street on a completely unplanned route. Around 2012, 
I traveled to a conference for work from Sacramento to Los Angeles with a co-worker for a couple days. We had some time to kill before boarding our flight back to Sac when I decided to roam the terminal for something to eat. After walking back and forth, I resorted to a random little counter for a pre-made sandwich or something. I paid, and as the woman at the counter handed me the receipt she said thanks, Isabel, which is my name. This moment seemed like an eternity, and I still remember the feeling of standing there stunned, but also questioning my intuition. Within 2-3 seconds I looked at my wallet to see if I had pulled out my id. I looked at my blouse and jacket to see if I still had a name tag on. I looked in my hands to see if I was holding a debit card. Did I pay with card? Nah. I also scanned the dang receipt for my name. The words how do you know my name were paralyzed on my tongue and nothing came out. Isabel is my name. That particular day was a hard day for me, as it was in memoriam to my father's sudden passing in 2005. I grabbed my sandwich and sat down next to my co-worker and was like so something weird just happened. I explained it to her, as well as the importance of this day because of my father, and she had no doubt, a quirky lady, and said oh, I love that stuff, I believe it. I still try to cast doubt on myself to this day that something must have informed this stranger of my name. It just doesn't add up, right? Ultimately, though, what I trust is the sensational feeling of standing frozen stiff because of something unfolding before me, no matter how little sense it makes. I think we've all had that feeling and have confidence in it more than we want to. Serious, what is the scariest theory you know about? I saw one about the potential of a specific type of supernova that would essentially fire out beam of radiation, or some other kind of energy, if it hit earth we would see the entire sky covered with auroras. This is the ozone layer burning off and the last thing we would see before we all die. Guess at least we get a pretty light shower to end on. I remember hearing one theory that every time we die, we instead instantly switch to a near exact universe where we didn't die, as if nothing happened. Other people's death remain the same since it's not yourself. For example if you were to be hit by a car, in other people's perspective you'd die, but in your own instead of dying, it's a near miss, or you're injured but don't die. That the Big Bang is just a never ending cycle. Each time the universe explodes into existence it will inevitably end then the Big Bang restarts. Each iteration of existence is just a rerun of the Big Bang. The theory is likely called Big Bounce. Don't forget the big crunch, which definitely ties into that. Basically we know that the big bang exploded and all matter in the universe is still flying outward from the big bang. The big crunch is the theory that everything will eventually slow down and then stop and slowly be pulled back to the spot that the big bang happened probably to start it all over again. As arctic permafrost melts, it will release diseases that have been frozen in the ground for thousands or tens of thousands of years and life on earth will have no immunity to them. Wonder how the world will react if a disease suddenly infected the whole world. We're good at following orders and social distancing so it won't spread that fast right. We don't know whether the universe is in a true vacuum lowest possible energy state, or a false vacuum a local low, but not the lowest. If the universe is a false vacuum, at any point, at any moment, a quantum tunneling event could occur where that point spontaneously decays to a true vacuum. If that happened, a bubble would expand from that point at the speed of light that radically altered physics, instantly annihilating everything down to the subatomic level. Since it travels at sea, there'd be no warning, no way to see it coming. When it reached us you'd just instantly blink out of existence. Even if we are in a false vacuum, such an event doesn't become likely for at least 10 circumflex 139 years, but it could happen at any moment at any point. It could have already happened and the bubble could be heading straight for us, about to end us at any t. The butterfly effect kind of freaks me out because it suggests that every little action could be part of a series of events that leads to something much more impactful. For example I could drop a pencil, which distracts someone for a few seconds causing them to miss the bus, and after a few billion seemingly insignificant events World War 3 begins. Equally likely that you dropping the pencil prevents World War 3. The two possibilities cancel each other out so you don't have to worry about it. I just woke up, so the explanation might be a bit confusing, but, humans are very good at seeing patterns, 
even if there are none. Looking at the brain, we can see parts of it that process some things but we can't see where consciousness comes from. What is we don't have a central me, but have a bunch of different, unrelated functions and one of those is creating a pattern that isn't there. I feel like when I read this over and over I understand it a little more. It seems so right, but I'm not awake yet to expound on subject. The possibility that I am just a brain in a jar and my entire life is just something my brain fabricated to keep itself entertained. Everything and everyone I have ever known is a figment of imagination. Every method I can conceive to prove this idea wrong is also just part of the dream logic my brain has created to make sense of the illusion that is my existence. Might not even be a brain at all. The true reality might be completely different with completely different physics, laws, and rules. Ours are the only ones that make sense to us because they're the only world we've lived in. You could be a pile of goop connected to a grid. That I, self-replicating, and immortal, has a better chance of colonizing this galaxy that biological life does. Think about it, it took hundreds of millions of years for life to get to this point. From a ball of proteins to multicellular creatures to plants and animals, took an incredible amount of time. Back in the late 1970s, I was playing with computers that had 4K of RAM. 40 years later we have incredible computing power in the palms of our hands, hundreds of gigs, and terabyte micro SD cards. Robotic manufacturing of everything from circuit boards to vehicles is the norm. Where will this tech be in a couple hundred years? Will you be able to design and launch spacecrafts that are capable of self-maintenance for the hundreds, maybe thousands, of years it would take to reach the nearest exoplanets? Once they arrive, will they be capable of self-replication? Machines don't need food and water. Machines aren't susceptible to disease, or mental health issues. Machines don't seek power, or authority, and don't victimize each other for amusement. What if the purpose of human life in the universe is to facilitate the creation of I and launch its spread into the wild? This could backfire. Read the Berserker series by Fred Saberhagen for more. Fractalization theories. Everything that exists is a tiny part of a bigger thing. In a brief summary, our galaxy is a part of space but is space a small part of something larger? Think of a smaller object containing its own galaxy. A speck of a rock may contain its own microscopic cosmos that we cannot see. It may be composed of its own organisms smaller than a single electron and that civilization is more advanced than we are. We know all matter contains their own gravitational force but we don't exactly know why. I've always believed this but I never knew it had a name. Forgive me for peep or job I'm about to do describing it since I forget the name of it but I recently read here on Reddit that as humans have a defense mechanism where we can see something that is non-human but mimicking a human such as a realistic wax figure and know that something is off. The theory was that in our evolution there was a predator that could mimic being human that we had to adapt and develop this defense mechanism for. The rebuttal to this theory was that it comes from a seeing dead bodies through sickness or disease and not blatant Neanderthal murder or death from an animal. Through our evolution and learning that something is wrong out of the ordinary and a cause for concern. The uncanny valley it freaks me out. 2. I feel as though the rebuttal is the accurate reading to why, but it's kind of fun to think of the other possibilities. So I can't remember the name of it for the life of me. But I learned this in a class I took last semester. There's a theory that says that there is a point that no intelligent life can get past, no matter what they do. Diving deeper into this, some people claim this is why we haven't found any other intelligent life forms. I think the truly scary part about it is that we won't know we are at that point until we are living it. It's called the Great Filter. You can think about it two ways basically, we have already passed the filter, and therefore we may really be all alone in the universe. Or, we have yet to hit it, and there's this looming thing that will keep us from advancing. I tend to believe we have yet to pass the filter. The Great Attractor. Over the years, scientists and astronomers have charted our space and we have a fairly good understanding of what's out there. Planets, moons, stars, space, etc. Gravity plays a big role in showing what is attracted to what. Moons around planets. Planets around stars, stars around black holes. But people have began to notice that everything out there in the galaxy is slowly, slowly but surely, scooting left on our map of the cosmos. 
Everything and anything is drifting ever slowly in one united direction and something hidden and astronomically massive is dragging us and all known and unknown matter towards it. And we have utterly no say or action in the matter. That the reason we've not detected other life forms is because they're hiding from a galactic level predator species that hunts through radiation emissions. Not so scary but some people say we are all dead now but our consciousness keeps repeating memories of our lives like an endless loop and it's the reason we experience deja vu sometimes. Just knowing the sun will eventually expand and envelop the planet leaving a burnt and blackened french fry behind is upsetting enough. Even if all these other things never happen, that eventually will. Imagine being around as that slowly becomes reality. Seriously. One day the Grand Canyon will no longer exist. There will be no physical trace of us ever having existed at all. Humans are alone in being intelligent life in the universe because we're the first to have had this combination of nonsense happen which led to the opportunity for us to do everything we can. This isn't that scary, but I often think about the last Thursday theory. The theory goes that we are galaxy, planets, people, memories, etc were all made last Thursday. All of the memories we have, have actually just been put in our brain. I love this theory because it's obviously very very unlikely, but it is still kinda plausible in the way that if there were any higher being, they could just create us out of thin air. Kind of like when you make yourself as a sim and your significant other. They have just been created, but obviously they have a backstory together because they're romantic partners. I don't know. I just think it's such an interesting theory to think and read about. Thinking that we're actually all characters in a simulation or we're just reliving our memories in the 7 minutes before we die is also fun to think about. 100 years from now the majority of us will be dead. We will just be another page in the history book. We may think that our life was very valuable, but we are just another century passing by. Just like how a lot of us don't think about how the 19th century as much. It will be impossible to remember all 7.5 billion of us living in this century. The next century will just remember the ones that help advance our species. This is exactly why I feel a constant need to do something absolutely revolutionary. That if time travel is possible here or in any other of the possible universes, that this may be the least cruel that would still be self-sustaining in the general trend of time. The Holocaust may be less cruel than a universe where Hitler succeeded and purged impure and undesirables from the planet, even among his own race. Heck, it may have been better than a universe where Hitler didn't do anything and without his success the general antisemitic and eugenically obsessed culture was allowed to meander on its own, slowly choking out and murdering cultures in much larger and less newsworthy ways. The torture and enslavement, the endless illnesses and abuses, and the lace affair attitudes we are seeing right now could very well be an improvement on a universe that would criminalize biological flaws and seek to only abuse criminals. Quantum suicide the idea that there's hundreds of me that died and I'm one of the few alive in an infinite number of worlds. There's nothing after we die. All of our memories, experiences, thoughts, feelings, ETC just immediately blinked out of existence, and this seems like the most likely and realistic possibility to me. It will be just like before you were born. There's nothing to be afraid of, it didn't hurt, it wasn't scary. The fact that if aliens do exist, they are either billions of years ahead of us, or we are billions of years ahead of them. It would be virtually impossible for them to become sentient around the same time as us. Especially if you consider how old the universe actually is. That the great biological filter is still ahead of us. And that humankind has no real purpose because it was destined to die like the millions of other species before. Regarding the great filter it could be anything. It could getting off the planet. Or not destroying ourselves. Or anything. But the presence of a natural filter would explain why we detect such few life forms in space. Let's just hope that the filter was make stupid cat videos and upload them and that we've brilliantly passed because if not then there is very little chance for humanity to have a future at all. Few life forms in space. To quote Spaceballs, we ain't found crap. It's debatable and contentious. Free will versus determination. And evidence from neuroscience that suggests people's actions occur before their thoughts. This would suggest that we have no control over our actions and are merely pawns in a bigger picture. Xir, Sarah, it's both comforting and scary.
From what I understand about it, we mostly operate on autopilot, and have our decisions made up before we are even aware of it, but we also possess a certain veto function, that we can use to choose to dismiss that autopilot proposed decision. That it is impossible to live in the now. There is a delay in what you physically feel and what your brains monitor because of the speed with which your nervous system transmits these signals. This makes the concept of now biologically impossible to grasp. On the other hand that delay is so small there's nearly no difference between real now and our now. Us living in a simulation. The scariest part about it is knowing that we have absolutely no control over our lives and anything bad that happens is just inevitable. Something goes wrong and you try to learn for next time? Doesn't matter, it was always going to happen and no matter what, it's likely going to happen again if it happened the first time. The fact that anything bad can whenever and we have no control over it is the scariest thing. Solipsism, which is a minfuck. Essentially life is a holographic reality created by your own mind. It is the idea that you only know your mind therefore you might be the only mind that exits. Since your mental state is private and unobservant to anyone else, you can only be sure of your own thoughts, and everything else is fake. The uncanny valley, you know, the sense of unease and discomfort you feel when you look at an irrealistic animation of a human face. Like imperfect deep fakes or flawed CGI faces in movies. It implies that there might have been a point in our species evolution where we had legit reasons to be afraid of something that looked almost human, but wasn't. I'd imagine it's because of death. If you came across a dead person you need to be able to tell they're dead and not just sleeping. Something seems not quite right with corpses, even though they look identical to a living human. That or there was a predator that could mimic humans which is now thankfully extinct. The eye takeover theory. There are several variations of the theory, but the basic gist of it is this. Eventually, society will be filled with billions of robots who can perform human-like functions. The theory is, some of these robots will become so intelligent, and so erratic, that they literally malfunction, go crazy, and eradicate mankind. Meaning, we would all die of slow, painful deaths of being beat to death by robots metal pieces punches pounds them etc. And the scariest part about this theory, is it won't be quick. Some variations of the theory say it could take years for this human extinction to occur. I don't know how realistic it is, but the late Stephen Hawking thought it sounded possible. I prefer the benevolent eye idea. That adaptive eye would eventually start making decisions that seem like malfunctioning, but are actually just more steps ahead than we can fathom. Downside is that we become totally dependent on eye and basically superfluous. The theory that the reason aliens haven't contacted us is because they're watching and waiting for us to be ready. The more I see of humanity, how we act under pressure and when confronting our darkest parts especially, makes me worried that we'll never be ready, or that we'll wipe ourselves out first. The Femi Paradox. Basically, we are either alone in the universe, or we are not. Both are equally terrifying. If we are alone, we will likely be stuck to our local solar system with a very basic understanding of what lies beyond, and practically zero chance of ever actually venturing beyond the outer reaches of our orbits. We may be doomed to live, grow, and die on a ball of iron and silica orbiting a giant ball of hydrogen in some forsaken arm of one of literally trillions of galaxies, each with trillions of their own stars. How many other habitable planets are there orbiting all those stars? How many have life that is advanced enough to receive and understand the signals we've been sending out for the last few decades? How many are a few million years ahead of us or behind us in terms of their development? What if we are truly unique and we suffer a mass extinction that completely destroys life on Earth? Down to the cellular level, if we are not alone, any civilization that is capable of reaching us from outside our local systems is for sure going to be many thousands, or possibly millions, of years advanced beyond anything we can comprehend. There's a ton of terrifying implications that can arise from this regarding life in the universe, but the one I find most scary is that if we ever do make contact, humanity would stand zero chance in a war against extraterrestrial life. Because to get here in any reasonable time frame they would need an understanding of warp speed or superluminous travel. On that same theory, we could be alone now, but not in the past or in the future, and we never know about it. It is not only space and distance, but time as well. 
The idea that human life as we know it is just a tiny blip on the timeline means there could have been literally millions of those tiny blips of 300.000 years already and we will never know about them. The theory that the universe is full of extremely hostile alien races whose strength is unimaginable, and that wiser races keep a low profile, and try to hide, we're the idiots who are screaming to be found, humanity is in a dark jungle full of predators, and instead of hiding we're screaming at the top of our lungs. Madlids. Maybe not too scary, but I heard a theory that there are infinite big bangs. Basically the universe undergoes a big bang, expands, and then collapses back into itself triggering another big bang. And this happens an infinite number of times, meaning that molecules and atoms are constantly shuffled and that every possible combination of molecules will come together and disperse an infinite number of times, meaning that you have existed a countless number of times before and will again. The buttons on traffic lights do nothing and it's just done on what color the other lights are. It's all just a way to get us to wait. Okay after reading the others this one cracked me up. Space time is doomed. Donald Hoffman is a scientist who proposes that human brains understand and perceive nothing of ultimate reality because evolution selected for survival traits, not traits which would enable us to perceive the true nature of existence. Much like a trash can icon on your desktop is a useful fiction that helps you use the computer, but there is no real trash can and when you drag and drop a file you aren't throwing anything away. The reality of programming languages behind the user interface, and binary behind that, and physical electronic circuits and components behind that, etc. Hoffman goes on to argue that the physical space-time world we inhabit is such an interface and not real. Unlike the simulation theory, he argues that simulation theory always assumes base reality is still a physical space-time universe. Hoffman has many podcast guest appearances and a TED talk. The expanding universe theory, well, we know it's expanding, but the theory that says it has a limit of expanding and once it reaches that, it'll snap back and crush the universe before expanding again and reforming it. The powerlessness and idea that tomorrow, everything I know could be crushed is a bit terrifying. Maybe it wouldn't snap back instantly, so you'd have a few thousand years of seeing the universe get smaller. If time travel does exist. Every change to the past would feel absolutely seamless taking effect, meaning you would never know. Strange matter. Well it's more a hypothesis than a theory at this point, but it's pretty weird. Basically, inside neutron stars may form strange matter, new kind of matter, that is more stable than atomic matter we all are used to. If a piece of this strange matter was to hit earth, depending on some properties this can have, it may be more stable than regular. It could potentially start matter decay, that would result in all matter on earth, including your bodies would decay into strange matter, basically killing whole plane in a very worrying way. When neutron stars collide the stuff inside gets spewed out everywhere, this means that at any moment a piece of strange matter could hit earth. The dark forest theory, all life desires to stay alive, there is no way to know if other life forms can or will destroy you if given a chance. Lacking assurances, the safest option for any species is to annihilate other life forms before they have a chance to do the same. And here we are broadcasting bulls into space. That there's a possibility, albeit very slim, that the species populating Earth are the only life in the entire universe. It's horrifying to think that it's possible for us to be completely alone, isolated on a small rock that's rocketing around a blazing ball of gas. There is a character from Marvel called X Nilo that has a great take on it. It's our job and duty to propagate life in the universe. We are the single thing standing between nothingness and infinity. The elites of America have pitted people who think they're Democrats and people who think they're Republicans against each other, in so successful a fashion, that the majority of non- Elites are fooled into thinking people from the other party are the enemy, while the elites sit there spinning their webs of corruption into the senate and into our laws to keep themselves uncompetitively rich, and the majority of us just sit there and hate each other instead of figuring out a plan to rid ourselves of this corruption. There is no true struggle but class struggle, everything else is division and distraction. Entropy can not be removed, once you created it you are stuck with it forever and the universe will eventually become a homogeneous boring soup because of it. 
that the recent interest in exploring space, SpaceX, Chinese going to the moon, NASA looking to establish a moon base soon, going to Mars, is because something is coming. If you vibrate a thing at the right frequency, it will disintegrate. The same can be applied to human anatomy in some sort of Dr. Manhattan level weapon. Pop. Vibe check. Forgot what they were called but here are two of my personal favorites. The theory that everyone and everything around you is a figment of your imagination and the theory that time has essentially stopped for the human race. As in this is as far as we can get in terms of advancement. Serious, Redditors who have lived in a haunted house. What are your most unexplainable paranormal experiences? My son, about 4 years old at the time, would jabber away in his room by himself. One day, my wife asked him who he was talking to. He said he was talking with Alice and that she used to feed the men who lived here. He went on to say that she died because she couldn't breathe. Our house used to be a boarding house before World War II. So this is currently happening in the house I'm living in, in NJ. A week or so ago at 3am I was just getting up to turn the heating off and potter around after falling asleep on the sofa. I was yawning and rubbing my eyes a lot and was just about to get up to go to bed when I realized this noise getting louder and louder. Like you don't realize it's happening until it's super loud. I suddenly realize and turn my head around to see the kettle boiling by itself. You have to push a button down and it glows blue. Which was highlighting the shadow of the button that had definitely been pressed. I freak out thinking I've lost time and it was me but I've forgotten soil rationalize and before I can stop myself the words but I don't want tea or coffee come out of my mouth and at which point the kettle clicks off. Like I literally heard the switch. It wasn't at the end of the boil either. I'm English and so used to 220 watt outlets which do everything twice as fast so I know it was in the middle of the boil. Also as soon as I said that I felt guilty like I shouldn't have been scared. Like it was a friendly offer. Two days later I was with a friend at the dining room table, both of us at least 5 foot and round the corner from the kettle, nobody else in the house. When it starts boiling again, my friend rushes over and points out the button has been pushed. So much relief came over me that I wasn't insane and I explained to my friend that this happened to me at night. A few nights ago I was lying in bed and could hear a conversation. At 4am, no one around, neighbors are 20 feet away either side. Then the kettle starts boiling, I'm pee. So I literally say out loud please stop boiling the kettle. We have people asleep upstairs and it clicked off again. This could just be a faulty kettle and coincidence. I don't believe in ghosts whatsoever and have never seen or felt anything before. It's just freaky, but it's not scary. Only my first instinct. I feel as though someone is trying to take care of me. Like when you were sick of school and lying in bed and your mum or dad would take care of you and bring you soup and stuff. Very very strange. If I were you, I'd ask the ghost to start the kettle every morning at a certain time for a nice cup of tea before work. A little backstory. Growing up, my brother and I lived with our single mother. The house was a little 500 square foot home, but we were young so it wasn't a huge deal. My mom remarried, and the newlyweds decided to tear down the old house and build a ranch on the land. Strange, but explainable. Things started happening after we moved back in. One of the strangest things to happen was when my brother and I were in the house alone. We were hanging out at an island in the kitchen, talking about what teenage boys talk about, when I hear the faintest wisp of someone saying my brother's name. Probably just hearing things. About 30 seconds later, a little louder, my brother's name again. He was talking when I heard the second whisper, and he seemed to hear it too because he stopped what he was saying briefly. Finally, about 15 seconds after the second interruption, clearly and angrily, a raspy voice says his name. We looked at each other and he asked, did someone just say my name? I told him I'd heard it more than once. He said three times, right. We grabbed our coats and went to get Burger King. I used to be a server for an old church school that was definitely haunted. I'd be there early to get ready, no one else around, and I'd hear a scream sometimes. Most of the time, the metronome on the piano would turn on by itself. It didn't really bother me though, because I grew up around the ghost of my older brother, who died before I was born. Lights and toothbrushes would turn on off on their own. 
Pictures would move or DVDs would fall for no reason. One time we placed a candy on a baby photo of him and asked him to move it. It moved. Thanks, older bro. We lived in an old slave plantation on St. Croix when I was a kid. Very few locals ever visited the place. So in a hoe when we moved in my sister, four at a time, asked my dad who the man with the big knife was. My dad was like the frick but decided to check things out anyways and found nothing. Then we'd frequently smell fresh jasmine blooming, which come on people have that crap growing in their yards. So whatever we move in and the locals are like what? You moved into that place and my dad would be like heck yeah. Why so they started to tell him about the slave who would serve the master's tea every day and about the ghost with a machete. We didn't move. Spent three years there. Dog ate an entire turkey. Foil and all. And there was a tarantula infestation but that's about it. Lived in a house from 1938. I would wake up and sit up in bed every single night at 2.59-3.01 am. I thought I saw something move quickly out of the corner of my eye on occasion but assumed it was me being sleepy bad vision without my glasses. One night the curtain on my closet moved. I pulled the lamp chain and the room lit up. My husband thought I was crazy. I saw nothing so I pulled the chain again to turn off the lamp. I tried to sleep again but a few minutes later I heard the lamp chain swinging against the lamp base. When I reached out to see if I felt it swinging in to stop it, something cold touched me. It didn't feel like the shape of a hand or finger but like a wet washcloth. We moved soon after that due to relocating but I stopped waking up every morning at the new house and haven't had any weird feelings since. I am typically a skeptic and can usually apply logic to a situation and figure out a plausible explanation. When I bought my house, they had to disclose reports of paranormal activity concerning the house. I thought yay, whatever but entertained it in good humor even addressing said ghost by name. There is nothing concrete that I can tell you. Nothing hovering in the air. No furniture appearing on the ceiling. Nothing that shows us any type of blip on anyone's typical paranormal radar. However, the number of times I have had to rationalize an event, or come up with explanations for why or how something happened, borders on obsessive. The typical footsteps upstairs, children laughing, before I had children, knocking on walls or doors, hey, it's an old house, creaks, groans, hot water pipes pinging, etc, it all happens, a light bulb smashed on the floor having removed themselves from the metal base. One plant in particular that would get overturned often, on one occasion ending up halfway across the room, the stereo turning on at random times of the day, almost always to classical music, so frequently, that I would always keep one classical CD in a random slot in the CD player just to see if that is the one that gets played. Various lost objects showing up in highly noticeable places, like how can you lose your watch in the middle of the completely cleared kitchen table, yet. After half an hour of searching, there it is. But the ones that get me the most are the ones where I am completely stumped. On the same day, every year, is the smell of something burning. It can be detected in only two specific but unrelated parts of the house. You can even define the limits of where you can smell it by walking around. After about two hours it goes away. Until the next year, the other one is the presence of hot spots in the house. Not by temperature. But when you stand in a certain place, you feel something. This has been witnessed by people aware as well as unaware of the phenomenon itself. And some of the spots have a direction associated with them. When you stand in one, you feel compelled to face a certain way. I watched a police officer get completely freaked as he turned in mid-sentence to stare at the wall, looking it up and down. Then took two solid steps backwards while looking at the floor and when he turned around, he was visibly shaken. But hey, no spinning chandeliers or dead girls climbing out of television sets, so I'm good. <laughs> Lived in a basement apartment with a roommate in college back in 2010. We were eating dinner in the living room watching a movie one night and his bedroom is like 3 feet away from the couch we're sitting on and closed over but not latched. So we're eating dinner and watching this movie and then his door starts opening and creaking so we pause the movie and watch as the door swings slowly open all the way. It stopped there and we looked at each other and claimed a breeze or a loose hinge. Then the door started closing again only this time, about halfway through the movement. 
The handle turned so that it was perpendicular to the ground. The door closed all the way and the handle released slowly latching the door closed. The handle in question was sort of like the ones velociraptors can open in Jurassic Park. From ages 517 I lived in a house with activity. It was all pretty basic run of the mill stuff. Footsteps. Voices. Lights turning on and off. Doors opening and shutting. Batteries draining. Etc. If we started renovating which we almost always were, they'd get more active and start throwing stuff. I got used to it, they didn't hurt us, so we just let it go. Even my father started believing after a while, but the worst thing they ever did was while we were moving in. I was 5, my friend and I were playing in the only room that was finished in the basement while my parents were moving the stuff in. My friend's parents were helping, suddenly, the door to the room slammed shut, no wind, no draft. No explanation. Then the lock engaged with a click, and someone started laughing. We were stuck in the room for two hours. Forgot about the time my Newfoundland, the sweetest dog I ever met, stood in the doorway of my parents' room with all her hackles up, barking at nothing. Barking her get the frick out bark. The house I grew up in had a slightly strange design in that all the bedrooms were clumped together at one end of the house and the kitchen and living room were at the other end. The two areas were connected by a long, narrow hallway that had a bathroom in the middle and approximately 900 closets on either side. My bedroom door was at the end of the hall, with two other bedroom doors facing each other across the hall on either side. Basically this meant that if you were sitting in our living room you could look straight down the hallway to my bedroom door. Now, lots of strange and frightening things happened in that house. But the one thing that we could never rationalize away or lie to ourselves about was the darkness at the end of the hall. Like I said above, the hallway was very long and narrow, and it was also paneled in dark wood, so it was pretty dark down there. But with the living room lights on there was always enough light to see down the hall and make out my bedroom door. But sometimes we'd be sitting in the living room and get the feeling that we were being watched, or that something was about to happen, when that would come over us. The end of the hallway would be completely blacked out. It was like someone dropped a curtain over the end of the hall. You could see part of the way down. And then there was just blackness. When this would happen, our three little dogs, God bless them, would go to the mouth of the hallway and sit in a line across it, staring down into the darkness. Sometimes they'd bark a little, or growl, but mostly they just sat and stared. Once in a while one of them would get brave enough to walk down the hall. But they never got more than halfway to the darkness before they'd stop and back up. They would walk backwards up the hall, never turning their back on whatever they were looking at. After a little while the oppressive feeling would lift, the darkness would disappear, and the dogs would wander off. This didn't happen often, but compared to all the normal spookinis in that house. Things disappearing, stuff flying off shelves, strange voices or breezes, etc. That was the one thing we could never convince ourselves was just in our heads. I lived in a haunted house for 10 years. I had 5 kids while living there. Every one of my kids saw the man in the hat on the wall. And they all saw him between the ages of 2 to 5. My kids turned 6 and they stopped seeing him. Once I heard my son screaming for me in the middle of the night, I went to him. He was 5. And he begged me to make his drawl stop. I said stop what hun and he said they keep opening and slamming shut. I can't sleep because it's too noisy. Things got moved all the time. And lost all the time. The spirit did not like babysitters and would torment everyone. The most violent episode was when I let my 15 year old brother watch my kids. We got home around 2am and found my brother sitting on the steps in the hallway between the front door and the kids bedrooms. He was shaking and crying. He said that when he got the kids in bed, the pounding started, everywhere all over the house. At one point it was so bad he went outside to see if there were people outside hitting the house. There was no one there. He had gone out the back door to check. When he walked back inside he saw the reflection of someone in the mirror, walking up the steps to the kids rooms. He went running thinking that someone snuck in when he was outside. He checked everywhere and there was no one in the house. But when he was upstairs he saw a shadowy figure streak around the corner of the steps. He heard the front door open and shut. He went running down the steps but the door was closed and locked. He proceeded to spend the next 3 hours chasing this shadow and hearing the doors open and close. He never babysat for us again. No one would. 
I had lights shatter above our heads and my children would laugh and talk to people in their rooms. We had neighbors call us at all hours of the night asking if we were okay because they saw gangs of people in our yard and sneaking around our windows. The cops got so used to getting the same 911 call that they stationed a cop in back of our house to watch our house between 2 and 3 am. There are so many more scary stories and the nightmares I had living there were deathly scary. We moved and the people that moved in after us stayed for a month. They said it was too scary. The house has been vacant now for 8 years. I have more stories but I think I already made a novel here. We lived in a haunted pub on the site of a former Catholic abbey that Henry VIII had destroyed. We saw some weird crap. The weirdest was the insectocutor in the kitchen. Something peeled it apart in the night. No sign of a break-in. All the doors were locked and the alarms set. It wasn't smashed. Not an explosion. The metal was peeled outwards. A couple months later we had an incident in the cellar. The entire pump system blew out, ruining one pound k of beer. Thor engineers could not find the cause of the fault and just replace the system. There were other incidents. People captured on CCTV that weren't there. The underfloor cellar doors slamming. The pub Furby talking in the middle of the night. And many more things that would be slightly odd out of context. Please tell me pub Furbies aren't a thing where you're from. So preface this story saying I'm a huge skeptic of any kind of stuff like this, but I've never found a way to explain this. My sister and then 4 year old niece moved into a townhouse apartment complex. Niece is 14 now and still remembers this vividly, ran into my sister's room not long after screaming about the man in her room yelling at her. My sister jumps out of bed and searches around for anyone or anything out of place. Finds nothing. Doors and windows still locked. Happens a couple more times over the next few nights. Niece doesn't want to sleep there. Won't go into her room. Etc. So my sister is chatting with one of the other moms at the complex playground one day and the other lady mentions how creepy that is considering the guy that overdosed in that apartment a few years back. Apparently his son's room was now my niece's room. So my mom does some digging and found the guy's name. Which led to his obituary. Pulled up the picture from the obituary and called my niece into the computer room. She got half a step into the room when she saw the photo on the monitor and ran out screaming about the man. Have absolutely no explanation as to how she recognized this guy's picture. So my husband and I rented a really old house. We had to fix it up a bit before my son came home from the hospital. He was very premature. In Niku for almost 5 months. We took down the wallpaper and painted. Took down the popcorn ceiling. The whole 9 yards. The basement was very unfinished and vandalized by the teenagers that lived there before. Swastikas everywhere. We didn't bother finishing it because we didn't really need the room. I went down there once out of the year we lived there. Creepy feeling. Like someone was watching you. P. Sometimes that creepy feeling would come upstairs. I would give it a week or so thinking it was in my head and then I would sit in the car with the baby while my husband burnt sage to clear it out. He says the feeling while he did so was heavy, very angry and he would see figures coming at him through the smoke. There were countless experiences there. The two that stick out in my head are as followed. 1. I was showering and the baby was in a little bouncer seat in the doorway. I opened the curtain and just as I do the can of air freshener that was sitting on the back of my toilet goes flying towards my baby. If the door wasn't just slightly shut it would have nailed him. I went full on bad crap crazy. I started yelling telling them if they are gonna mess with anyone mess with me. He is just a baby. Blah blah blah. As I'm doing so the detachable shower head I had went flying off at me. Hit the end of his rope and swings down. Shut me right up. 2. My husband and I were in bed. My son in his room right down the very small hallway. Fast asleep. We had a baby monitor because he was on oxygen and therefore on a pulse ox monitor so I wanted to be able to hear his alarm go off. So my husband and I were laying in bed together. We usually will talk for a while and then say our goodnights and fall asleep. We say our goodnights this particular night and not even 5 minutes later we both hear. Clear as day. A little girl laughing in the baby monitor. My husband jumped up out of bed ready to kick some butt. But I already knew no one was there. I was stunned. Literally. Couldn't move until finally I fell asleep. I do not miss that place. That's terrifying. I have lived in two haunted places. The first was a house we lived in for a short time when I was 12. 
we heard what sounded like rats running across the attic every night, so my mom had the exterminator set out tons of sticky traps. We never even caught a bug. Then, I would wake up with random injuries a few times per month, like scratches when my nails were short. The final straw was when I woke up with what looked like a cigarette burn on my face. Thankfully the scar has faded, but it was very upsetting. We sold the house and fo were there. When I was in my mid-twenties, I lived in a haunted apartment. These spirits were nice, though. I lived alone in a fourplex where my direct neighbor was never home. He got sent to prison a lot, and the downstairs neighbors never made noise at night. One worked, and the other took clonopin every night. It was a weird neighborhood. I would hear people whispering in my hallway nearly every night. At first, I would get up and look for the source of the voices. The parking lot was still. Nobody outside in the courtyard, and neighbors either gone or passed out. It happened every night. Finally, I would just say can you keep it down? I'm trying to sleep, and the voices immediately stopped. Every time. They also opened my blinds in the mornings before they thought I would be awake. A few times, I woke up early on my day off to go to the bathroom and saw all the blinds in my living room open. I was perplexed, but when I came out of the bathroom a few minutes later, they were all closed again. This happened often. A random happening that was the scariest thing ever. My husband died, and I had him cremated. I was still young and had no children, so I moved on after only about 6 months. My now husband had just started staying over at my place when the weird stuff started to happen. First, I saw a shadow person in the mirror on my wall. Then my clock fell off the wall one night. Finally, I experienced horrific sleep paralysis and saw the shadow person again while experiencing the sleep paralysis. I have never been so scared in my entire life. I finally decided to spread the ashes of my deceased husband, and everything stopped after that. My deceased husband was a mean man, who blamed me after his friend physically shamed and assaulted me and eventually killed himself by not taking the insulin for his type 1 diabetes because he was trying to spite me for kicking him out. It kind of figures that he would haunt me once I moved on. Serious, when driving at night, what is the scariest most unexplainable thing you've ever seen? Attention. Serious, tag notice, jokes, puns, and off-topic comments are not permitted in any comment, parent or child. Parent comments that aren't from the target group will be removed, along with their child replies. Report comments that violate these rules. Posts that have few relevant answers within the first hour, and posts that are not appropriate for the, serious, tag will be removed. Consider doing an AMA request instead. Thanks for your cooperation and enjoy the discussion. I am a bot, and this action was performed automatically. Please, contact the moderators of this subreddit. Message composed to equals our ask reddit, if you have any questions or concerns. <laughs> Scariest only because it nearly killed me. Driving back from a late high school football game that I was covering, I was going through a very remote section of highway and farmland. I was a little zoned out, but the road was straight and wide for a while. I was going along at a good clip when I was vaguely aware that there was suddenly something in my way, but it was almost just a sense of it, not anything I could really see. Something just didn't look right, and I could tell hitting the brakes was not going to help, so I swerved into the opposing lane and passed something large that had been blocking my lane. I still didn't know what it was, but it was large. I got turned around and went back slowly to see what the heck I had barely missed. When I got close enough to see better in my headlights, there they were. Two very large, completely black cows. They were big enough that my hatchback would have been totally crushed if I'd hit them, and it could have easily been a fatal accident for me and the cows. I called the local police and they sent a car out while I waited to make sure no one else hit them, even though the cows wandered off the road a ways and I hadn't seen another car for quite a while. When they got there, they knew who the cows belonged to and called the guy up all pee off because this apparently happened more frequently than they liked. TL. DR. Dang cows nearly killed me. About 20 years ago, I was driving home from a late wedding DJ gig. I was driving south on a major interstate which was relatively empty at 2.30am or so. At one point, in the narrows, the retaining walls on each side get very high as the highway snakes underneath overpasses. Out of nowhere, a young woman jumped down from the retaining wall onto the highway and directly in front of my car. I hit the brakes hard, 
came to a complete stop, and nearly slammed into her. She looked up, ran to my passenger door and got in looking terrified. She looked between 16 and 20 years old, long blonde hair, and her clothes looked a little dirty. Not homeless dirty, but like she'd fallen down a few times. I just need to call my mom, she said. I tried to calm her down and began moving back down the highway and behind me about 50 feet. I see another figure jump down onto the highway out of my rear view window. I didn't mention this to her and she didn't look back or see the other person. I sped up and went about 4 or 5 exits south. She kept saying over and over, I just need to call my mom. This was before most people had cell phones. So I told her I would take her to one of the 24 hour grocery stores and she could call her mom. I asked her if she needed money for a payphone, what was wrong, etc. She said nothing other than, I just need to call my mom. I pulled up to the grocery store and stopped. She got out quickly, but not running, then ducked into the grocery. She didn't say a word to me or look back. I pulled into the gas station across the street and called 911 and told them the entire story and let them know the young woman was inside the grocery store and a description of her. I have no idea what happened. I don't know why she did that, what happened to her, who the figure behind us on the highway was, nothing, really made me super uneasy, I think I did the right thing, I would have tried to do more but she seemed really fragile emotionally and somewhat afraid of me, I am a guy, so I wanted her to just be able to get to where she needed to be. Hey man, you definitely did the right thing, I hate to think of what might have happened to her if you hadn't helped Jay was driving with some friends at around 2 a.m. rainy cold night along a winding section of road with a steep drop off to the river below on one side we pass a small pull off and notice a car with no lights on as we drive by we catch a glimpse of a person standing next to it and as the headlights hit him we see his shirt is covered in blood all down the front we don't stop but turn around and drive back slowly i roll down my window as we approach and he just stands there Blood all over his shirt and pants. His car looks fine. Couldn't have been a crash. Out the window I ask if he's okay. And over the pounding rain and roar of the river below I hear the most distant and sorrow I'm fine. F gave me chills. I don't reply and slowly drive off as my buddy calls the cops. About half an hour later we drive by again and there is an ambulance and a couple cruisers. Turns out the guy slipped his wrists and was going to jump off into the river. Cold rainy and pitch black. Scary where your mind can take you. There's a public park near my house, which gets pretty dark at night. I was driving home tired and exhausted after midnight when I realized that someone had dragged all the garbage cans and other large items out into the middle of the road to form a barricade of sorts. I'm not sure if it was just a lame prank or if someone was waiting for a car to stop so that they could rob the person. I didn't bother to find out. There was just enough room for my small car to slip through. It's happened twice in the past few weeks, so I'm going to assume it's just some teenagers being jerks. J call the police. Since it happened a couple times, then something is up. A big cougar running next to my car then for no reason decided to commit suicide and run under the side. I wasn't sure if it fricked my car up and was terrified to get out and check. Eventually my 18 year old brain decided I should check. It was dead but looking back that was really dumb of me. This story is one where I was the one that, unintentionally, scared somebody. I was driving home from a friend's late one evening, probably around 3am. The town I live in and grew up in has a reputation for being a racist area thanks to a few high profile incidents and a reasonable amount of racist idiots living having lived here in the past. As I approached the town, I was going round a roundabout when a car joins, ignoring my right of way and cuts me off a bit. It was a crap bit of driving but I'm reasonably good at not letting that get to me. What was mildly irritating though was given how keen the driver was to get out onto the roundabout in front of me. He then drove about 5 miles per hour below the speed limit on the way into the town and like I said it's late and I just want to get to bed. About a mile later we reach the main street of the town which has many turn offs and I'm still sat behind them. They pick one of the quieter turn offs which is the one I usually use to get home. At the end of that street they can go left or right and still end up at the other end of the housing estate. And they choose right, which is where I need to go. Then they have a few turn offs in both directions before hitting another main road. They choose the quietest turn off, 
I presume thinking I'm following them and wanting to see if I actually am or if I'm just making my way into the main road. Unfortunately for them, they've turned onto my road. They're crawling along it at this point, obviously slightly worried. The driver probably thinks I'm still pee about being cut off and I'm following him for some sort of revenge. So they decide to pull in and let me pass. They indicate and pull across a driveway which just happened to be mine. I had to pull alongside them and open my passenger side window. The driver opens his and there's two three black teenagers in the car all looking slightly terrified by the pretty big skinhead. Not by choice. White guy who has been following them and now pulled up alongside them in the middle of a quiet estate in an area known for being racist. The look of relief on his face when I said sorry mate, that's my driveway you blocking there was pretty hilarious. Poor kid was scared shitless but somehow in trying to get rid of me made a series of road choices that convinced him he was about to be murdered. Car in front of you before they turn. Please don't go right. Please don't go right. You. Please don't go right. This woman was on the side of the road and asked me to come look at her car, which was parked in a large turn off. I asked what was wrong and she just kept saying to come look. I apologized and drove away and she just stood there while I drove away. More weird than scary but it was night in the country and I was alone. While working one night was called to attend a head on car accident with 3 people killed. The driver of one vehicle wasn't wearing a seatbelt and the force of the impact had embedded his steering wheel in his forehead. His best mate was in the seat next to him and was conscious and making the most horrific shrieks. We'll never forget that image or that sound. I was driving to work at 3 in the morning, I work at an airport, and I was in the middle lane doing 70 miles per hour when a lady ran at my car, in the middle of a highway, waving her arms. I swerved into the left lane so fast I couldn't believe I didn't hit her later, and kept going. I would have stopped, I really would have, but something in her face didn't say I need help, it was more I'm on massive amounts of drugs. When I got to my lot 10 minutes later I called 911 and told them what happened. I never heard anything or saw anything in the papers so I assume she wandered away. I used to work by LAX in a small office park just south. As I was leaving, driving past the air force base just down the way, some guy in a suit, like typical business attire, ran through the center of the street in pitch black darkness. I can sorta relate. I thought I was driving into Silent Hill when the road looked like it was flaking off and blowing away. Just Nebraska after harvest and the dried husks were blowing away. I was driving in Maine and there was a moose just hanging out on the highway. I just remember screaming and driving in the breakdown lane. I never realized how big a moose was. I also don't know why it was calmly standing there. I had something creepy happen to me a few months ago. I was driving home after seeing a play with a friend of mine, so it was probably around 11.30 p.m. 12.00 a.m. Also, I live in rural America, so there weren't any street lamps or houses for the majority of the drive. I was driving over this bridge and saw a car sitting on the side of the road turned on. I wasn't really concerned about it because it's a common spot for cars to pull off, even if it was kind of late. As I passed the car, I looked in my rearview mirror and saw that they had pulled out behind me. Again, I didn't really think anything of it, until they began to tailgate me hard. While that behavior isn't unheard of, it tends to be rare since the road is curvy and a hotspot for deer. I kept driving for a bit with this car right up on me which caused me to feel frustrated, confused, and strangely paranoid. Then. The car's headlights went out abruptly while I was nearing the end of a stretch of road surrounded completely by forest. This made me freak the frick out because it was still super close behind me. Then, the car sped up and went around me, but almost immediately slowed down to a standstill in front of me. At this point I was so afraid, so I sped up, went around the car, and drove way too fast to get home and then sprinted inside and locked the door. I didn't notice the car around my house. But I still feel worrisome about the entire ordeal and wish I knew why someone would drive like that. When I was a kid, living in Charleston, SE, my dad took me and my brother to a boat landing on a creek, right off of the intracoastal waterway to shoot off some fireworks we had left over from the 4th. This boat landing was up in the sticks in a place called Wadmalaw Island very sparsely populated and pitch black at night. When we pulled in the parking lot of the boat landing, Around 11pm, 
There was a 20-ish foot power boat nestled against the dock. The only people there were several guys wearing white boots and loading the back of an SUV with boxes from the boat. There was also a sports car, not sure what kind. We instantly got the heebie-jeebies, turned around and hauled butt. About 30 seconds later, there was a car speeding towards us in the rear view mirror. We were already going 80 miles per hour, because my dad was convinced it was drug related, and it was gaining very quickly on us. We knew we couldn't outrun them. My dad drove an 81 Audi Fox, so before we went around a curve in the road, we killed the headlights and pulled into the driveway of someone's house, ducked down and waited. That car that was chasing us flew by, must have been going 100 miles per hour, easily. We sat there for a few minutes and saw the car going back to the boat landing. Crap could have ended very differently. I'm guessing sea shipment? TL. DR. Me. My dad and my brother witnessed a drug delivery. Got chased and barely escaped. Nice move on your dad's part. I've been waiting wanting to post this for so long. And now I'm late to the party. Anyway. I was driving very late at night through a pretty big park in NYC but not Central Park. Now this was after an all night film shoot for one of my friends in college and I had been up for a very long time. As we were driving past the wreck building with the pool I see a person, galloping on all fours like a crab. They were moving so fast and I thought I had just been imagining it. But when I got home my boyfriend at the time who was sitting in the front seat asked me if I saw the crab person. It was super spooky and I just can't explain it. My friend and I used to go drive around our little country town at all times of the day. We'd chat, listen to music, and just sort of drive around for no real reason. One night, we decided we were bored and that we should just take a drive around the back country roads and just chill out. The roads were just two way, one lane each, with a speed limit of 45-55, I think. So, we pull out from my parents house and start cruising down a normal road that we take. We pull up to the normal four-way stop and then keep heading out toward the country where the road gets a little bit more rough. On top of this, because it's actually out in the country, there isn't really any light aside from either the moon or the few houses that you pass on the way out. So, on the way out, I start getting this really weird feeling. I've driven this road tons of times before at night and I've never had this feeling before. It felt like a stone in my stomach along with some chills that were going up my legs and my arms. Around the time that I started feeling this, there was a car coming toward us going the opposite direction. We were maybe a mile or so away from one another, probably a bit more than that. My friend and I were still just talking and not really paying much attention to the car coming toward us. As it got closer, I remember feeling particularly uncomfortable and the conversation between my friend and I just sort of stopped abruptly. The car that was coming toward us was basically right in front of us at this point and it was about 2-3 yards in front of my car before it flipped its headlights off and veered into our lane, aimed directly at my car. This was all split second, back country road, pitch black, and headlights coming toward us just cut off completely. I, by some miracle, managed to swerve to the right, not too violently, to get out of the way. My friend and I were shaken as frick. I checked my mirrors and just saw the car flip its headlights back on and continue driving from the way we came. I think my friend and I had 5-6 cigarettes between us on the drive home and we decided to cut the drive extremely short because of this weird crap. I still have no valid explanation other than maybe it was some drunk dude in a car just fricking around with us. Even writing this, I still get heavy chills lol. It was pretty wild. We were driving down the mountain from a campsite on an old, dirt road, headed for town. It was 4th of July weekend, so we had gone camping, and headed home just as it was getting dark. We go around a bend in the road and our headlights pick up on something huge hunkered down in the bushes on the side of the road about 30 feet in front of us. We slow down and we're trying to figure out what the F it is, because it's moving. We let the truck crawl until we're about 10 feet away. That's when our headlights pick up one very large eye. Dang bull moose stands up from the bushes and tears across the road in front of us. Making that weird, grunting noise they use when they're grumpy. Let's shine a bright light on this giant creature in that bush WCGW. Sounds like a bull moose was one of the better outcomes of that scenario lol. 
We were on a cross country camping trip in the summer and we had been camping every night for 2 plus weeks in different campgrounds every night. We were using a AAA guidebook to find the best campgrounds and they were almost always full of people. We read about one that was very well rated and free. When we got there it was late at night and we drove through looking for a good campsite. Problem was, we didn't see a single other person anywhere there. Dozens of spots, all empty. It was heavily forested and with it being so dark out and nobody else being there we all got a creepy vibe. I was only 12 or so but I was begging my parents to not stay there because I was so creeped out. My parents agreed and we went somewhere else. Never found out why it was empty or what the deal was but I've never been that creeped out before for seemingly no reason. I was driving to Grow the Mountains once on a very foggy night. A herd of elk becoming visible through the fog ahead of you is pretty scary. In 1994, my mom and I were driving from Colorado to Montana for my uncle's wedding. I was 4 and sitting in my car seat in the passenger seat. We were in a fairly nice white rental for the trip because our family car definitely couldn't make the drive. It was after midnight and dead quiet on this stretch of Forest Y Highway with no lights or houses. We were in between towns somewhere just before the Montana state line. My mom was going about 70 miles per hour on one of those thin, winding roads without a care in the world when bam. A gigantic buck was standing in the middle of the road. She swerved but the huge antlered bee jumped the same way causing us to plow into it. Its body spun down the right side of the car, knocking off the mirror and denting the frick out of the door all while releasing a barbaric forest animal death cry that was unlike anything I've heard since. My mom was obviously shook and sped off because A what if it's still alive? And B we gotta find a phone and report it, right? It took us about 20 minutes to get to the next town and find a bar. My mom ran in with me, both of us frantically crying and all these burly men jumped up to help my mom. I assume they thought one of us was injured or in immediate danger. My mom relays the event through tears and then they all look at each other ask, well, did you keep it my 5 foot tall 105 pounds? Mom tells them that no, she did not drag a buck with trophy size antlers into the car with her 4 year old. They all started high fixing and asked her for the closest mile marker to where she hit it because that's good meat. My mom used the bar phone to call the cops and when she gave them the same story, they also asked if she kept it for meat. She figured country people in Montana are starving weirdos and that we should push through because we only had a few hours of driving left. We got to my uncle's house around 4am and immediately went to bed. Just after 7am, someone starts banging on my uncle's front door like they have metal fists. It's the cops. They had gotten about two dozen calls in the half hour since the sun came up about a murder car in my uncle's driveway. It's our white rental. Dotted in deer fur and absolutely caked in blood from the grill to the trunk with the right side of the car looking like a crunched up tuna can. We had no idea we were driving around in a nightmare mobile. My mom is horrified and tells the cops about the deer. Her call to the cops a couple hundred miles away, and how scary it was. The cops deadest looked at my mom and asked her if anyone had claimed the deer for meat. We've not been back to Montana since that trip. TLDR. My mom dang near totaled our rental by mowing down an absolute unit of a buck on a rural stretch of Montana highway, unknowingly caking the car in guts. And everyone we told wanted to know what mile marker it went down at for free fresh venison. Somewhere in some bar in Montana they tell the weird tale of the city slicker that got lucky enough to get a few hundred pounds of free meat and just decided not to keep it for some crazy reason. Once when I was 19 I got off work early at about 3am. I always took the back roads to avoid dealing with highways and really it was almost a straight road directly south of my job to get home. There aren't any street lights and once you go about 2 miles it turns into dirt road with a few 4 way stops. On this night it's foggy and visibility is crazy low so I'm only doing about 30 miles an hour. As I come up to one of the four way stops, there's a house tucked back from the corner with an old lamp post in the middle of the yard, basically halfway between the intersection and the house. I had been intentionally looking for this lamp post as it was a good indicator of how far I'd gone down the road as the fog was very thick and I was a bit nervous about it. I stop at the intersection and look over at the lamp post and see a man or a man like figure standing beside it. Just standing there. At 3am on a foggy night. 
Goosebumps from head to toe and the hair on the back of my neck stood straight out and I immediately felt unsafe. The figure never moved as I drove through the intersection but the rest of the trip was dirt road with high rows of cornfield on both sides. I'm doing 30 miles per hour. Terrified. Heart racing. Just knowing at any moment that figure is going to walk out from the cornfields into the road and I'm gonna be murdered. Nothing did happen and I made it home just fine. But to this day it still gives me chills thinking about that figure. And just to be clear, I'd driven by that house countless times in the past and again after that. It wasn't a scarecrow or anything of the sort. I bet some dude needed to clear his head and came off a lot creepier than he wanted to. A few years ago I was driving alone at night through a shopping center and noticed things seemed sped up a bit. Like when you watch a video at 1.25 speed. Everybody was walking and moving too fast. I actually shook my head trying to shake it off. A few minutes later I was fine. I still don't have an explanation of what I experienced to this day. One night my wife and I were driving home from a 2am Walmart trip along a particularly empty stretch of highway. We come up over the top of a long hill and as the car levels out we see two deer halfway across the road. The deer that was leading the other broke into a sprint. The deer behind them froze. And I pumped the brakes all at the same time. Somehow this was all timed perfectly such that our car threaded the needle gap between the two deer that formed from the time when the one in the back froze till we got to the deer. Maybe 200 feet at 65 decelerating to 45 mph. Nobody was harmed. Human or deer. The car wasn't even grazed. We call that moment the deerical. Deerical just take my up vote. About 6 years ago, my family and I moved from the west coast to the midwest. Dad and I drove while my mom and younger siblings flew. Dad was driving the U-Haul and I was driving the van that we had at the time. We stopped for dinner around 8 and realized we had about 6 hours of driving left and decided to push on through. GPS took us a very weird way and had us exit on a rural route highway instead of staying on the interstate. So we are following this little windy road for what seems like forever. It's just past midnight when all of a sudden we are in this little town. Everything seems old and the houses feel like they are 10 feet from the road. There's not a single street light in this town so the only light is from our cars. We get to the house and my dad doesn't say anything about the town so I assume it was my mind playing tricks on me. A few days later I tell the story to my mom and she tells me dad told her the exact same story but thought since I didn't mention it that it must have been his mind playing tricks. I've tried to find this town again on many occasions and I have never had any luck. Serious, Redditors who have died temporarily nearly died. Did your life flash before your eyes? If not, what did happen? From my grandfather. He has heart issues and had an internal defibrillator fitted to help his heart beat normally. To test it they stopped his heart while he was awake, but he kept talking to the doctors about the weather and normal old man stuff. When his heart restarted he felt a little shock and asked what was that. I was enjoying myself. The doctor replied welcome back to life. The doctor told him afterwards that he should have just stopped being awake and fallen unconscious. And thus was the only time anything like this had ever happened to one of his patients. Stubborn old man. My uncle died and got resuscitated. And when he came back to life, he was annoyed with the doctors because death was so beautiful and peaceful. My heart stopped when I was in the air for 34 seconds. Not really a life flash but a very calming feeling of as I describe it. What was I even worried about? Everyone everything is going to be fine. When I had my car accident I had the exact same feeling. It was like I pierced the veil of reality for a second and my perspective was really clear that no matter what everything was so okay. And I hope death is as peaceful as that honestly. I had a near death experience when I was about 5 I was drowning in a pool. I probably didn't have enough memories at that point for anything to flash before my eyes. And I was also very focused on trying to get my head above the water again. I remember looking up at the sky through the water. That the surface started to look geometric like tessellations. Then I experienced some sort of depersonalization. I had a distinct feeling that I was outside of my body. And I watched what happened next. My mom saving me. From a distance. I suffocated during surgery due to a series of errors with the nitrous mask and monitors that had been removed and not immediately put back. As I was suffocating, I tried to signal, 
Realized I was under so much nitrous I couldn't move. My ears were ringing. I thought about my husband, and if my daughter would be okay. Cursed the anesthesiologist because one of the nurses said I didn't look good and he said no one could move until he finished this part. I remember blacking out, then watching from a corner of the or while everyone was rushing to work on a pink blob. I could see everyone clearly, but one thing was a blob. Realized the blob was me, and they were trying to resuscitate. I intentionally did not go anywhere because I wanted to be there when I was resuscitated so I could be alive again. I just existed in that corner watching the chaos. Then I woke up on the table, bruised but alive. Man, I really hope all you people are telling the truth. What an experience. Maybe a little late to the thread, but my dad flatlined with a failing heart. When they brought him back the doctor asked where he had been. My dad said he was picking blueberries with his long deceased mother and his sister. 1000 miles away that sister woke up in the middle of the night, woke her husband and said something was wrong with her brother. She had been dreaming that she was picking blueberries with my dad and their mom. I get teary eyed every time I tell that story. He died a few months later. Missia. Dad. I remember slipping into a relaxed, giddy state, a place where it felt okay to not worry about a thing because it didn't really exist or mean anything anyway. It was a detachment while also being aware of people around me tending to me, discussing me amongst themselves, and I just submitted my body to them while my mind enjoyed this totally chill, at peace, dreamlike state. I imagine it was due to blood loss and shock but it was interesting all the same. I often wonder if it's a state we enter naturally near to death, and if it is, I'm okay with that. There was absolutely nothing. No light, no memories, nothing. It was like it didn't exist for about an hour or so. I didn't experience the passing of time either, so the entire time I was dead seemed like an instant. It was sort of like teleporting into the future. Most H or OPTODs will feel like you're drifting off to a much needed sleep. That's what's so scary about them. I bled to death after a car accident. I went somewhere. I can't say for sure if it was real or just a weird chemical trip in my brain but the best way I can describe it was like being in a hallway made out of space. It was beautiful and incredibly peaceful. I saw flecks of memories passing by me but I wasn't focused on them. Then a woman's voice that felt like it was everywhere told me I could wake up and suddenly I was alive again. I'm pretty sure before you die your brain activity suddenly spikes which is probably why you got all those memories. I nearly drowned in a swimming pool when I was 9 years old, at a hotel, when my family were on a holiday. I remembered it like it was yesterday. At that moment, my legs and arms locked up, my lungs felt like stone, and then I slipped out of consciousness for I'm not sure how long. I woke up to the lifeguard pumping my chest. During the time I was unconscious, I was floating, probably because I was in water, in space filled with stars. I tried to swim over to one of the star and found out there were fragments of my memories, voices, noises, smell, faces, places, all jumbled together. But a big part of those fragments were my mom, my dad, and my two younger brothers and a cousin who was also my best friend. It wasn't like a memory or anything. To put it into words, it was more like a soup of everything I've ever seen, heard, tasted, smell, and feel all there. Then I woke up. I've never seen that vision again, but I still remember it clear as day. I had my heart stopped at the hospital because my heart was going 150 bpm for hours. I even had the readout printed out of me flatlining. I had a heart condition and was on acid. My life did not flash before my eyes. It felt like a black cloud spreading through my body the heart stopping injection. Which makes no sense. I should note I have over 4 years drug and alcohol free now. But when it was over the doctor was walking out of the room turned to me and said better living through chemistry. Her crazy experience would not recommend. I am security guard and couple years ago guy attacked me in the parking garage and stabbed me. When I was bleeding and losing consciousness I didn't really saw memories it was more like memory with better outcome. Sorry about my bad English. Not my first language. I had a near death overdose experience at a young age. I remember a black presence came to me, and I knew it was my death. I felt very strongly that it was not my time to go, that I had so much more to do. 
I also had an OD and no life flashing before my eyes or anything. Just felt really tired and the overwhelming urge to sleep. Maybe I wasn't near enough to death to have the memory thing to happen. But it was dang scary enough knowing I might be slipping into my last sleep right now and I couldn't do anything about it. Sorry on mobile etc. My body was completely infected with sepsis. The emergency room staff had placed me in a tub of ice to try and help fight the fever. I had two IVs pumping. I don't know what all into me. Next thing I knew, everything was dark. I could feel other people around me. I felt so happy and light. I was free. There was no fear. Somewhere I could hear my best friend yelling at me. BCH don't die. I am not raising your children. My mind snapped too. Immediately I knew I had to go back. There was no way I was going to let her near my children. Woke up right afterwards and was amazed at how heavy my limbs felt. I have no fear of dying now. I have raised my kids. And she is no longer my best friend. Lost 2.5 liters of blood in childbirth. Midwives hadn't realized, despite me telling them how unwell I felt and that I was going to be sick. It wasn't until I sort of passed out and remember them saying blood pressure was something over zero. They hit the buzzers. A lot of people came rushing in and I just lying there for what felt like a long time feeling everything go quiet but wasn't peaceful. Just absolute sadness consumed me that my husband was about to be left without me and that my new son wouldn't have a mummy. A lot of oxygen, drugs and a couple packs of emergency blood transfusion later and thankfully I was okay. Still very mentally scared by the whole thing. But main moral of the story, please give blood if you can. It's only thanks to the kindness of strangers my baby has a mama and bleeding out during childbirth is a lot more common that I ever realized. This is the scariest thing for me to think about. How happy that moment would be for the dad. And exciting. Then just watching the love of my life not make it. I would be crushed. I wouldn't know how to handle it. I DK. I just. I DK. I died briefly due to complications of having leukemia, pneumonia, chicken pox, 108.9 fever and encephalitis, spelling, at the same time. It was that nothingness in between falling asleep and waking up. I knew nothing happened. It's hard to explain. Drown when I was 3, and was gone about 90 seconds. Dying is a painless experience. Well, there is no pain in your mind. Your body is another story. Best way to describe it. You feel everything and nothing at the same time. You feel free and lost. Being young I didn't have as many memories to see, but I do remember seeing myself pulled out the water. It's hard to explain. There's something beyond death, but it's not what you expect. I overdosed when I was 14. I gradually transitioned from life into a state of peace and bliss. I saw felt something. The presence of something wonderful but heavy. Heavy and old and not meant for us mortal folks. I felt that I was on the very brink of entering this place, of finding something great, but I was always just on the edge. It was so long, and so tiring, and I was just waiting to experience this thing. Next thing I know I'm back to the real world, and I never had the chance to experience the greatness. Number. I floated out of my body and looked down on the room, saw the medical staff trying to revive me and just felt awesome. In a very detached way, I thought well, my family is gonna be pee, but physically I just felt like I was floating and very, very content. I remember being excited to see what was next, then I was revived, I no longer feared death. It was a great experience, I just want to know where my people were, I thought they were supposed to come welcome my butt, or something. This comment made me think of dead like me. I have been clinical dead twice. Both times during tests in a hospital. No light. No life flashing before my eyes or out of body experience. Felt just any other time I lost consciousness. With the sole exception that the disorientation and confusion was much bigger after waking up again. Despite only a few minutes having passed. And being in the same place. If they told me I had been out for weeks. Months or even years. I would have believed them in those first few minutes. Also I really wanted to go pee and kept trying to get up to go to the bathroom, and had to be stopped several times by the doctors and nurses. I overdosed, I stopped breathing and had no pulse. There is blackness, there's no thought, there's no feelings, there's no past, 
No future, just drifting in this blackness. There was no bright light, there was no flashing of my life. Do you remember what it was like before you were born? That's what I feel like it was. It was timeless. I had no knowledge that I had died but I had no knowledge of a me eat I ha. I do not find death to be scary now. I know that it is a peaceful, timeless place. Or it could have been all the drugs I was on I'm sober now btw. The thing that hurt was waking up. When I was maybe 6 or so, my friend and I thought it'd be a good idea to play in her pool without her mom there. I didn't know how to swim and found myself slipping into the deep end. For a while I was panicking and struggling against the water. I held my breath as long as I could and eventually started to breathe in the water, which made me panic more, until eventually I stopped resisting. Eventually this great sense of calm came over me. I remember crapping my pants and not caring. The last thing I remember was looking up and seeing the light dance and refract beautifully against the water with so many colors. Then it just went black. Apparently my friend who could swim got her mom who did CPR on me long enough for an ambulance to come. My lungs were full enough of water that I was medically drowned. My mom was at the hospital and they were scared that even if I woke up I would have brain damage. But I woke up fine. I told my mom that God has big hands and that I saw Jerry Garcia. I'm not religious at all and wasn't brought up in that sort of background, but I have definitely believed in a higher power since that day. I've kept a picture of Jerry Garcia in my room since high school to watch over me. I feel like the best answer I can give for this is kind of, at age 15. My mother almost murdered me bc she was super drunk and while I expected her to just routinely beat me, she had been getting drunk and abusing me my entire life. I was in a for a rude awakening, I just saw, the end, that, maybe that grey haired guy on America's most wanted, didn't know John Walsh's name at the time, was going to talk about the murder of me, this 15 year old girl by her alcoholic mother and that I'd have a funeral and so few people would attend though. What vividly did flash before my eyes was all of the abuse, and, it came down to the cold metal at my throat. I was ready to die. I didn't but, sometimes I wish my mother had done me in. I'm in my 20s now and, I've realized both my parents are pieces of crap and narcissists and, I'm probably better off without them, despite the big butt package of PTSD and trauma I now carry with me. Number. Same as a few other comments it felt like I was falling asleep. I didn't feel much but I remember it was really dark and I heard echoes of the voices of the people around me. Scary stuff. Not sure if it was a near death experience but it did feel like I was dying. I drowned and was brought back with CPR. All I remember from it was that it was a quiet experience. And dark. Everything just faded to black. I put brought back in quotes because you don't perform CPR on the truly dead. It can preserve life, but it cannot restore it. I had no pulse, but the CPR was begun before my system completely lost oxygenation. It's at that point you're considered dead. I was alone at home, and choked on a fatty piece of steak I was eating outside. At first I could only get little gulps of air in. Then I tried to take a bigger breath and just lodged the steak further down my windpipe completely blocking it. I considered throwing myself onto the back of a chair to attempt the Heimlich maneuver but was convinced it wouldn't be successful. I was initially worried about passing out and falling out my wheelchair so I started pushing myself to a nearby sun so I could lie down. But then realized since I wasn't breathing it was probably going to be the end. I remember thinking something like wow, so this is how I die. I didn't expect it to be this soon. I have contemplated suicide quite a lot. Fortunately the stake dislodged itself, possibly from the motion of me pushing the wheelchair, maybe helped by some slimy throat saliva or something. The whole experience lasted about 45-60 seconds, but really freaked me out, and I still don't really know what to make of it several months later. I didn't get close to death but was definitely sure that I was about to die, so it was more of a psychological minfuck than a physical or near death experience. I eat a lot of steak. But now take smaller mouthfuls, two more, and avoid big fatty pieces. My dog is grateful I'm sure, and my feelings about suicide are a bit different. I think I'm more scared of death than before, even though I remained quite calm during my experience. I think the most scary thing is that it can really happen at any time, even when you're just relaxing at home, enjoying a steak in the view.
Very similar thing happened to me with a pork chop when I was 15. I didn't want to eat solid food for months and the idea of death terrified me for years. I just couldn't stop thinking about it. Glad you okay and you're feeling different about suicide. I'm happy you're with us. I had a grand mal seizure. From what I was told I stopped breathing. Got CPR came to thinking I was just sleeping no recollection of it. I came back discombobulated. Confused. Thrashing around with the EMTs. I got to the hospital and was placed on a crash cart. Had multiple EKGs. I honestly thought I was going to die. But to be honest nothing flashed before my eyes. I was in a high impact car accident. Back then I was young and stupid and didn't like wearing my seat belt my face hit the window. I was the passenger. Basically the driver was speeding like heck and the idiot was drunk and did a legal left turn. While the driver hit the brakes aggressively before the impact, I honestly thought I was going to die and in my mind I told myself, this is it for you. You are so young and have not lived life. Life is not fair. In all honesty, at the time I didn't quite comprehend it. It was a slow fade to black, and the noises that were going on around me somehow didn't penetrate my brain. Yes I could hear them and yes they were there, but the comprehension didn't happen. Like those few moments when you wake up and you hear someone talking to you but it just sounds like noises. I didn't feel anything. No pain. No struggle. Just a soft nothing into dark. I don't really know if mine was a hallucination from the high fever the pneumonia had given me or what. I was 4, and collapsed into a pile of dirty laundry trying to get into the living room where my mom was. I can vividly remember pulling laundry on top of myself trying to get warm so I could make it farther, and seeing a bright, golden light envelope everything. It formed into a tall woman in flowing clothes and then my next memory is waking up in the hospital a couple of days later. 4 times I almost died. This includes dialysis, comas, emergency surgery. Twice my heart actually stopped. Those times colon. At age 8 after suffering anaphylactic shock due to a dye injected into my body for a kidney scan. Didn't see crap. Only felt sick. Zonked out then was out cold until my hearing came back as if I was underwater and I saw the paddles on my chest and felt the shock jolt me hard. Age 33 I had a kidney infection. These can be very serious if left and treated as I was born with severe reflux and had my ureters removed and re-implanted and suffered 48 stroke 52 damage to my kidneys. I went into septic shock. My husband found me unconscious. I was in a coma for a week and had dialysis. I had told my husband two days before I was ready to go now and was at peace. He thought I was tripping due to medication I was on. I knew I was going to die, but when it happened I felt nothing except when I woke up I had the feeling my mum and auntie besides my husband had been in the room. Can't explain why because I didn't hear them. I was in a motorcycle accident when I was 18. I was going 110 kmhr when I was thrown from my bike. My bike was destroyed. After the paramedics realized I was okay they told me I shouldn't have ever lived through that let alone get up and walk away afterwards. I know the whole thing was over in a matter of seconds but it seemed like ah. Uh, there was lots of good memories going through my mind and the feeling I had was so peaceful and calming. I ended up losing consciousness but when I came to I remember being so happy I had another opportunity. I was being drowned by someone. They didn't know what they were doing. They were drunk. No memories flashing before my eyes. Everything went black and silent. I remember it felt like at least 30 minutes had passed. It had only been a couple seconds and I came to I couldn't see anything but white and I asked am I dead. I wasn't dead, but I was only 8 and I couldn't understand what had happened. Something else I vividly recall from the experience is no longer drowning or not being able to breathe after I blacked out. By the time I had come to it felt like I was just normally breathing air, but I was still underneath the water. I sincerely hope your parents cut that individual out of your lives. Not how close to death I actually was but it felt pretty scary. Went to Tanzania a few years ago with a large group of people to do work experience in a hospital. On one of our days off were taken to this big waterfall. Everyone was paddling around the river plunge pool but I was like heck yeah swim time. Was swimming up to the waterfall against the force of the water pushing me back. I was swimming hard against it thinking it was a bit lime a water thread mill. 
Suddenly I got too close and found myself sucked down by the falling water maybe 4 meters under. I was getting rolled head over heels for about 30 seconds before I clocked what was happening. I remember very clearly thinking in my head swim up you're going to drown so I swam to what I thought was the surface put my hand above me to feel around and felt the bottom over the pool. I was so disoriented from being thrown around I couldn't work out which way was up and started to panic and thrash around with my arms. I felt a rock wall and kicked against it as hard as I could which managed to push me out of the water sucking me down and into water moving downriver. My head found the surface and I came up gasping for air. No one out of the maybe 15 people I was with had noticed I'd disappeared under the water for about 1 1 stroke 2 2 minutes. Nothing flashed before my eyes but it was weird how cut and dry my thoughts became. They were like a separate person giving me specific instructions to not die in my own head. What's the closest to death experience you've ever had? Myself and a couple friends decided drunkenly to paddle boat across the lake we were staying at, in the middle of the night, in May in Canada. The boat had a hole in it and sank halfway across. Lake water in May is like ice water. It sucks the air out of you and you are kinda in shock instantly. I'm a decent swimmer but I was sure that was it. We stripped naked and started swimming. I just, just, just made it to shore. My other buddy was okay but my one went under like 10 feet from shore. My one friend was just tall enough to touch the bottom and lift him out and carry him to shore. We were all purple and obviously had hypothermia. I can't stress how important life jackets are. 5 more feet my best friend would be dead. 20 more I'd be dead. Other buddy maybe 50. Life jackets. Every time you're on the water no matter what. Oh yeah I live in Massachusetts on a pond. A lot of people are seasonal residents so we'd sled down their driveways in the winter and if you shot out on the ice normally it'd be thick enough to support a 12 year old. One year it wasn't and man in full snow gear I sunk. But I got out. We used to start swimming in March to see who could do it earlier but that January water is no joke. When my appendix ruptured, I went to the emergency room in the most intense pain imaginable. I was taken to surgery almost immediately after I was scanned. I spent 3 days in the hospital recovering. I had appendicitis, but didn't know it. So I went to the hospital in the middle of the night but they didn't have the right ultrasound so they sent me home for the night. Went to a different hospital in the morning. Thankfully it hadn't ruptured. I nearly fell over 200 feet inside a tall cathedral bell tower when trying to help the sexton ray attach a rope that had come loose from one of the large bells at the top of the structure. The old wooden ladder, about 135 years old, gave way. But fortunately, I was able to land on a large borden bell and sit on it until the sexton could arrange for help. Arosha. When I was 5 my granddad gave me a hard candy, and it slid down the back of my throat. I freaked the frick out and reached my hand down my throat, grabbed the freaking thing, and threw it on the ground. My family got angry at me because they didn't realize I had been choking. I was in Seoul. I stepped out of a bus when a glass bottle of soju was dropped from a 20 story tower. It fell directly above my head but I made a sudden move and felt it graze my cheek before smashing between my feet. I'm certain had it hit my head I'd have been killed instantly. If dropped from near the top it would have accelerated to around 120-140 km per hour so yes, you would be very likely to die. Not me but my mother decided to empty a hydrogen peroxide bottle into an empty water bottle because she's kind of crazy about seeing too many bottles. She put it by her bedside table and then proceeded to accidentally drink the whole thing in one gulp. The minute her stomach started blowing up she knew what happened. She comes running to me and tells me she just poisoned herself and is feeling her stomach inflate. I am celiac so I can't eat gluten so I just so happen to have carbon pills that I use when I am glutened. These can also help with poisoning. She drank like 15 pills and just starts blowing up. Ended up throwing up black goo all over herself and me but I was crying happy tears in the car while she threw up because this was where I realized she would live. At the hospital, we were rushed right through because she came in in a wheelchair covered in black goo. The doctors kept coming and talking to her about why she poisoned herself and why she had a cure right at home. She is fine now but it was really crazy. Never, never 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 put any liquid that is not meant to be consumed into a drink bottle. Even if you might know what's in it. Other people don't and mistakes like the one you stated happen too often because of that. 
If anyone ever saw that one news story where the ninja ride at Six Flags Magic Mountain derailed in July 2014, was there on my birthday, I was in line to go on that ride. Technically, nobody died on it or anything, but it's probably the closest I've even had to a near-death experience. A true near-death experience. Went climbing in a seaside cliff, stopped for lunch in an alcove, at lunch and got up to climb down. As I turned around, a chunk of rock fell from the ceiling of the alcove and landed exactly where I was sat. If I'd stayed a few seconds longer, I would have been crushed. Was on a hot air balloon for the first time while vacationing in Arizona with my fiance. It was a large basket with maybe 8 of us in it. I was already super nervous and I was just watching the altimeter rise up and up as we got higher in the air. We had taken off with multiple other balloons and one young kid in particular was making his first solo flight apparently. While on the radio the pilots are constantly communicating each other's locations and they kept asking where that kid was and nobody could pinpoint where he was. I look at the altimeter that just passed 5300 feet, over a mile high. And I just start looking around for the kid and his balloon. Just as I look down, I see a balloon coming up fast directly below our basket. I freak out and start screaming holy crap right below us and just then the top of that balloon nails our basket from below and jostles the whole basket nearly sideways and his balloon scrapes against our basket and our balloon as it rises upward and that little punk just f king laughs it off as he floats away. I thought I was going to plummet a mile to my death with my fiance in my arms in that moment. I will never get in one of those flaming death traps again. Some people deserve to get their butt kicked. That guy definitely does. When I was 15, I went to the F for prolonged dizziness and sleepiness. They kind of ignored me because it just seemed like a kid wanting out from school. Then they actually tridged me and I had a blood pressure of 48 stroke 22. That's in line with a 3 month old baby. I fainted right after they took that. My heart rate also never got above mid 40s. I was in my own private room, of higher emergency level than the motorcycle accident guy, with a crash cart in my room and the hospital trying to arrange a helicopter transport to a bigger trauma center. I was given 5 liters of fluids over just a few hours without any change. My head had to be kept below my heart to make sure I was getting enough blood to my brain. I wasn't otherwise, which is why I was dizzy and sleepy. They never figured out what was wrong. They found I have a prolonged QT interval, but it comes and goes, which is apparently even more abnormal. I know when it happens because my chest hurts and I get dizzy. If I don't sit lay down I will faint. It can take anywhere from a few seconds to several minutes to pass, but it always does. I was prescribed more salt and water, and that was that. I didn't even realize how close I was to death until like a year later when another doctor straight out told me there is no clear reason why I didn't die that day. I've got the same symptoms except my mom didn't take me to the doctor she just told me to let down. Woke up 5 hours later. During my birth, my umbilical cord almost strangled me to death twice. Ironic that the thing that was keeping me alive was trying to kill me. The same. I didn't start to cry so the doctors had to slap my butt repeatedly until I took the first breath. Was working at a scout camp when I was 14 or 15 or something. Worked at shooting sports as an assistant to the older dude 60. We'll call him Greg. Who was teaching the course. There was a guy who was probably 24. Call him Jack. Working the shotguns while me and Greg would do rifles. Well Jack freaking hated me. I never did anything but I am a very hateable person in his eyes I suppose. Greg had his concealed carry gun stolen from his truck. They were investigating what to do when Jack told me that he was going to kill me. I was scared shitless and of course I called my dad who called the camp leader. They found the stolen gun in Jack's trunk. God I have no idea what would have happened if I hadn't said something. I was on holiday 5 years ago. We rented a speedboat and went swimming in the lake. I stupidly decided not to wear a life jacket and I'm not a strong swimmer. Went to swim back to the boat and the water had swept it quite a bit away. Became too exhausted to keep myself above the water. I started having a panic attack and was sure I was going to die. I just went limp and under. My boyfriend's sister's boyfriend had to swim to me and hold me up until my boyfriend got back to the boat to throw a ring out for me. Sometimes I choke on my spit. It's not close to death. But if I am dumb enough to do that, 
Every meal is an extreme experience. I knew a 29 year old girl, she worked in the laundromat, that choked to death on a marshmallow. I will never eat marshmallows again. One time my mum told me to get the chicken out the freezer and kept reminding me and I was like yes I will. Anyway she pulled up 5 hours later and the chicken was still in the freezer. Ah, the old do the thing before I get home and meaning to do it but also having Netflix, Reddit, and video games. I actually died. When I was 21 I had way I, I, I too much to drink one night at the bar I was working at, stayed there drinking after hours with co-workers, who were all in their mid late 30s and could drink a heck of a lot more than I could. Around 4 in the morning everyone was ready to call it a night but I refused to leave the bar and became belligerent. Was blacked out this is what I was told. Finally they called me a cab and had to physically put me in the cab. Not really sure what happened in the cab ride but basically I ended up getting thrown out of the cab while it was moving. Less than 10 mph. And I'm assuming I hit my head when I fell out of the cab and passed out in the road. And while I was unconscious I vomited and choked on my vomit and stopped breathing. By some miraculous stroke of luck moments after that happened somebody who lived on that street decided to walk their dog at 5 in the morning and found me and called an ambulance. I woke up at noon the next day drunk as heck in a hospital bed on a ventilator. Some guy at the hospital, can't remember if he was a doctor, or an assistant or what, read me the report from the first responders that said when they got to me I was unresponsive and had to be revived. Whoa. My friend also died after being buried upside down in sand. Took them 5 minutes to get him out and a few more to revive him. His lungs were full of sand and his hip was stuffed up from trying to be pulled out by it. Work on an ambulance. Had a call at like 2am for an elderly woman with low blood sugar. We get out there and are in the process of treating her when a black SUV pulls up. Tatted up Indian guy gets out and power walks up to us and asks what's going on. He then looks at me and says I look a lot like a cop and asks if we're cops. Guess the ambulance wasn't obvious enough. Well some nervous laughter and a no definitely not cops his attitude seems to change and we leave a little bit later. Well. Turns out he was in the IBH, Indian Brotherhood, and the next weekend he ended up getting in a shootout with cops while using an AR and wearing a bulletproof vest and he was looking to kill some cops. Guess I'm glad he asked us first. Indian as in Native American or as in guy from India. When I stuck a knife in a toaster in an attempt to get toast out of it, the power to the house got cut when the switch tripped because of it and I thought I was going to get electrocuted. One of my only cooking tricks is to hold the knife over the toaster so it warms up the blade and makes it easier to go through the butter when it's ready. I never share this tip though because I don't want someone to drop the knife into the toaster and blame me for the dumb idea. Had severe brain swelling for no known reason. Had a coma induced to take some of the strain away when I was about 7. Apparently they didn't think I was going to wake up. I don't remember much of my life before that. Ouch that's rough. My friend had brain surgery for a blood clot when she was 11 and doesn't have any childhood memories either. One day I was walking down the sidewalk to go grab a bite. A bit down the way all I hear is this squelling noise and a car swerves off the road and almost hits me. Didn't get super close, but close enough to be within 4 feet in front of me. The car crashed into a mailbox and then a light pole. I literally could not for 5 seconds out of fear but it felt like an eternity. I hurried up and called the emergency services, and ran over to see if they were fine. The driver was fine and she said that she didn't wanna hit a pothole and mess up her newly purchased car. After the emergency service people came and asked questions I went back to the store. Kinda was out of it but I still walk to the store super cautiously now. While coming home I dropped my drink I bought. Interesting day for sure. When I was maybe 12. I was at the beach with a really large group and we were all out a bit further in the ocean than I was really comfortable with. Couldn't quite touch the sand anymore. There had been some inclement weather the day before and the waves were a bit rough. At one point a large wave came crashing down on top of me and sucked me under. After being flipped around a bit, I tried to surface but was so turned around that I ended up slamming my head into the seafloor. Started frantically trying to find my way back up to the surface and as soon as I finally found my way up and started to gasp for a breath of air, another wave came down and pulled me under again. At one point I remember thinking, well, 
Guess this is how I die and was oddly at peace with that. I stopped resisting and somehow surfaced again. When I finally had my bearings, I had been pulled really far away from the group. I slowly made my way back and tried to tell some of the others what had happened and that I needed to go lay down because I was freaking exhausted from almost dying. Sad part was that nobody had noticed the ordeal, or seemed to believe me. I ended up walking a mile back to the hotel by myself because nobody else cared to leave. <laughs> Sorry for bad English. I was driving my scooter and my friend was seated behind me. We were on a straight highway. So there is a slightly elevated bridge that we crossed and I was kinda going fast. 60 kmhr. So as we were at the downslope of the bridge suddenly a pothole came and after getting hit by it my rear tire suddenly got flat. I noticed it as my scooter first started itself turning to total left then right. Thank god to NFS Carbon and other drifting games movies that I learnt enough about counter steering by which I was able to keep both us from falling. My friend literally was screaming bro 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 bro. Hopefully no vehicle was coming behind us although it's a really busy road. Imagine the other cars on that highway. Some scooter hits a pothole starts freaking drifting. I shot an arrow at a target that was in front of a concrete wall. I missed and the arrow came back and hit me in the forehead. Horizontally. Good god. My family once went on a trip to Britain. Specifically Scotland mostly. And we were to stay in a place called Apple Cross. We thought it was a little weird that they were the only place that we stayed at that requested payment before we even got there. That should have been our first red flag. I'll spare you most of the details about getting to the road to Apple Cross, but we thought that the worst of it was over. The GPS said that there was only 10 kilometers to go, but it was going to take around 45 minutes. That should have been the second. We get to the Apple Cross Pass. And it's a one way road with little spots on the side of the road for drivers to pull over when another car comes by. The road was suddenly at a 20% incline. We were covered in heavy fog, with only about 10 feet of visibility. There were 90 degree switchbacks that we had to maneuver around. There were barely any guardrails for a several thousand feet drop. We had to do this in a 9 seater van. Then we had to do it again to get out. Apple Cross was a nice place though. In second grade I was on my way home on the school bus when a gas tanker truck ran a red light. The bus driver narrowly avoided it without impacting anything anyone. At the end nothing happened but without the good reflexes of the driver we might have crashed with an tanker and probably exploded. Got a combination of flu and something else. Still don't know 100% what. That made me vomit sp much I went to the emergency room. My sodium was dangerously low, near the stroke range, and for a while it wouldn't go up. Ended up in the hospital for a week, and had a point where an artery IV was caught and pulled out in my sleep. If I wasn't under constant watch, would have lasted about 15 minutes. Safe to say the Grim Reaper was just a couple blocks away. It was a few years ago, in the 8th grade, my teacher was basically in butthole and had no idea what she was doing. So she told us all to go into the closet when we had a lockdown drill. And lem tell ya, packing 18 kids into a small closet isn't a great idea. I was in last, since I was towards the other end of the room. But before I could make it in, someone slammed the door shut and half of my ring finger fell off. I started to feel really dizzy and started to feel a sharp pain in my finger. I looked down and realized what had happened. I saw my ring finger hanging onto my hand by a strand. I remember. Kids in the classroom were screaming, running around, a lot started throwing up, one had a panic attack, I was rushed to the nurse and I felt really lightheaded and was rushed to the hospital, worst day of my life, but I'm still here thank god. Cause of death, lost his pinky finger to a door. May 2013 tornado and more, okay, passed terrifyingly close to my high school, and I thought I was for sure going to die that day. I even sent what I thought would be the last texts I'd ever send to my family telling them I love them. Community lost a lot that day. That tornado gives me nightmares. It was videotaped by so many people who narrowly avoided dying. All those storm chasers trying to outrun it and you could hear the terrible suction it had trying to pull them into it. It was a monster. Glad you survived. So many. My dumb stuff I did as a teen favorite was swimming in a river in New Brunswick over a waterfall, and hitting my head on the bottom, getting stuck in the hydraulic, 
Basically a sideways whirlpool that holds you down, and passing out, came to behind the waterfall in a little cave, which I then decided was really cool and explored for a few minutes, then swam out, to find my buddies freaking out and looking downstream for my body, they had very harsh words for me. If you were my friend I would be in furious haha. When I was in Mexico me and my dad were swimming in the ocean. We are about 40 feet from shore. Some guy starts yelling at us from shore so we decide to see what he wants. He tells us that there was a bull shark about 10 feet away from us and then we realize that there was nobody in the water and everyone had their cameras out taking pictures. Gotta love humans. Basically waiting for the shark to go after you too so they can take pictures. I was swimming at a lake and used a pool noodle, only one noodle, to get to the other side, wasn't the best idea, about halfway I lost balance and started freaking out, didn't know how to swim at the time, but eventually, I got my balance back and swam back where I came from, now I'm afraid of lakes. My physically abusive mother had been escalating her abuse after she discovered I was in a relationship with an older man, I was 15. I skipped school to see him and she found out. She had me pinned to the wall by my throat and said I'll kill you calm as could be. She told my siblings to watch me. She had to take my older sister to work. I went to the bathroom and called a classmate. I told her to wait a couple hours then call the cops. I had tried to report my mother before. Broken ribs. Cigarette burns. But she was a good liar. I needed proof. I was going to fight back. That would infuriate her. She came home and I don't remember what happened after that. My next memory is being pressed onto her bed. She's laying on me. Crushing me. My mom is huge. She was choking me saying what's wrong with you over and over. She only stopped because her best friend came in the front door. I passed out. When I woke up my teacher was calling me over and over. There was a cop outside for me. I jumped my back fence after sneaking out. I never stepped foot in that house again and left the state a week later. Hope you're okay now. I was 6 and was pretending that this refrigerator in the basement was a rocket. This was in the early 70s, and it was an unused old style fridge that had a latch on the door. I locked myself in it, and over time, felt it getting warmer and more humid. A friend of my older brother, about 17 years old, found me about 10-15 minutes later. Later in life, I knew them to be big stoners at the time. I wonder now if he didn't have the munchies, would I be alive right now? I can only imagine being stoned like heck, opening a fridge and finding my buddy's little brother inside. I took 60 pills, 40 Benadryl, 20 or SMTHL that I forgot what it was called, in 8th grade, passed out, started having seizures. My mom took me to the hospital where the doctor thought I was gonna die bc my vitals were everywhere so he told my mom that I'm probably not gonna make it and she called in a priest to give me my last rites lol I survived obviously but I lost 7 lbs in the span of a day, couldn't walk for days, and to this day I have constant nausea and puke very often. Hit a cattle grate on a longboard going at least 35 miles per hour was unfathomably lucky to walk away with only a hyperextended elbow and a concussion scar above my eyebrow, and that my sunglass lenses didn't shatter on impact and get in my eyes. Wear a freaking helmet. The driver of one of those biggest 18 wheelers had earbuds in and started to merge lanes, while we were next to him. If my window was rolled down I could have touched the side of his car with my nose. Sorry for format I'm on mobile and don't use reddit much. Context. I use my grandparents house to get dropped off and picked up from school since I like the district they are in. A couple of years ago the government turned the two lane road into a four lane with a large divider which made it a mini highway but with houses. When I was younger I was getting off the bus after my last day of primary school when a small flatbed truck, the ones that carry a car after a crash, decided to continue driving on the same lane of the stopped bus while also speeding. He swerved at the last second and his back tire hit the concrete sidewalk which somehow sent a large chunk flying past my head into my dad's Toyota Celica. He then drove off full speed but some guy in his car had a dash cam and caught it all and stopped by later that day to give us the evidence of the guy speeding as well as his plate number so we could report him and charge for damages. Around 8 years old at Valley Fair with my family, was a really skinny kid, stick figure, chicken legs, you get it. 
That will matter later on. I was just barely tall enough to ride the wild thing. Back then the wild thing's seat belt was a lap rope belt similar to one in a car, and a metal lap bar. My mom and I got into a car together, and I noticed my legs weren't long enough to reach the bottom of the car to brace myself on the drops. When we started going down the very first massive drop, I started to slouch as I wasn't tall enough, and I found out pretty quick that my skinny butt legs weren't strong enough to hold my weight either so I started to slide down under the seat belt. I was telling my mom the entire time I'm going to fall out I'm sliding out I'm going to fall out she thought I was joking. She wasn't paying attention which I don't blame her for it's a scary ride lol. And she was laughing at me until she looked over and saw that my chin was the only thing holding myself in the car at this point. She pulled me up back in my seat and held on to me for the rest of the ride. It's pretty crazy. It seems like that happened in slow motion as I replay it in my head. But it was really only about 10-15 seconds. My mom hasn't been on a ride since. And I. 24F. Haven't been on the wild thing since. I have a couple other stories. But this one still fricks me up lol. Serious? What experience made your blood run cold? Mundane? Paranormal? Or just plain terrifying? What happened? When I was a teenager, my friends and I were hacky sacking on my one friend's street around 4 in the morning, tripping face, which probably made the experience worse. All the lights were off in the houses and it was super quiet. Out of nowhere we heard this blood curdling scream and the light flipped on in a room of one of the houses. I could only describe that scream as someone finding their baby had died. Incidentally, I noticed balloons on their mailbox the following day, like you might put there if you just had a baby. We called 911. The dispatcher told us the people in the home were calling 911 as well and that they were on their way. My friend didn't know those neighbors so we never found out what happened. It was absolutely horrifying and it still gives me chills to think about it. ETA. I don't think the lady was going into labor. It sounded like straight up terror scream. I was taking a walk in the middle of the day once when I was a kid. It was really quiet and I was almost back home when from a neighbor's house I heard a scream like that. It went on what seemed an inhumanly long time before it cut off. Started again, then just sobbing. People ran out of their houses to see what was going on and multiple people called the cops. The woman's baby had died of SIDS. I was in class, and had been working on a project. I looked down at my phone and realize I got a text from my mom, and all it said was your dad is in the hospital, I need you to stay with the kids. I called my mom who was freaking out. Without the context, I was rational and able to calm my younger siblings down while we waited. The moment my mom called from the hospital, all she said was I need you to stay calm when I tell you this. Instant ice in my veins. I've never felt that level of dread again in my life. It had turned out my dad had already passed from a major cardiac arrest before he even got to the hospital. I know this feeling. When I was 15 I actually witnessed my dad's heart attack and as he was dying I screamed I love you while the paramedics were rushing to him. After I ran to the basement because I couldn't bear to see him choking grasping for air. Worst feeling. Mundane but common. That feeling of realizing you've lost something important. Especially when traveling. For example anyone who's ever been approaching a gate in an airport, has reached into their bag, and failed to locate any tickets knows what I'm talking about. On a trip to Italy a few years ago, I misplaced 600 euros in the wrong pocket on my bag. I was freaking out as it took me 3 hours to find it. Mundane. I went to my child's kindergarten to pick her up. My husband was out of town. There were about 5 children there left. Mine was nowhere to be seen. Child has already been picked up. I've been with this group for an hour and she had already been picked up an hour ago while she was with the other teacher. We have no family in this city. My blood ran cold and had to sit down. The teacher then realized that there was something amiss and went white. Then I started to scream my child's name through the building. It turns out she had wet herself while in the toilet and was ashamed to go out. So she had stayed for over an hour in the cubicle and the teacher of the next shift had just assumed she had been picked up. Oh thank god. My kids are 28, 25, and 18. And this type of story still gives me the sweats. Realizing that my mom is starting to go downhill fast. She has terminal cancer and the last couple of months she started to sleep more and do less. I realized this two days ago. 
I haven't quite come to terms or processed it completely yet. Turning a corner of a hiking trail the same time a black bear is turning the corner. I think we both had the same reaction. Probably too late, but here goes. My grandma had a massive stroke and was in the hospital on life support. She hadn't regained consciousness since she had been found slumped in her armchair earlier that week. My mom and I were at my aunt's house when my mom got a phone call. It was my grandma. She said she was okay and she loved us and she wanted my mom to come to the hospital to be with her. My mom left. I was too young to go into the IQ. She called a while later to tell me that my grandma had died without ever regaining consciousness. It was not physically possible for her to have made a phone call, but the caller had matched the hospital phone number. It still gives me chills thinking about it, because I can't think of any explanation. I worked as a nurse's assistant when I was 17. I took about a month off for winter break and when I came back, there was a new resident who had been there about since I left. He was bedbound and only occasionally was gotten up into his wheelchair. While doing rounds one night, I went into his room and he begged me to take his socks off. They haven't taken them off for 4 weeks he cried. Well, he had some slight dementia and I knew he was probably exaggerating. But hey the guy wants his socks off. I'll do it you know. I took off his socks. The skin of his heels literally came off into the sock. He was sobbing in pain. I went from normal, to cold and numb, to the most white hot rage I'd ever felt in my life. I stormed out and said some choice words to the charge nurse and the other aides on shift. Fun fact, I later had the same guy as a hospice patient when I quit that job and went to a, much better, home hospice program. His wife had pulled him out and taken him home. These stories made me so angry. Elder abuse is real and very often ignored, since most people don't much like old people. Thank you so much for all you have done to stick up on their behalf. Coming upon a car that had run off the road, pouring rain, I stopped to check, along with several rig drivers. I had current first responder training at the time. Driver is conscious, minor injuries, babbling, probably concussed but otherwise okay. Passenger, not so much. She was belted. That was the sad part. Force of the impact with the tree snapped her neck and crushed her chest. I could tell she was gone, but continued with the first response routine anyways until the EMTs arrived. Made my blood run cold to be that close to death. My dad was in a head-on collision once. Tractor trailer forced the other car into his lane and got away. He and the driver of the other car had seatbelts on able survived. The passenger of the other car didn't and died when she was thrown from the car. Always wear your seatbelt. I just had the chance to post this the other day. I ended up posting a different, much less scary encounter. But here's this one. Us kids, 13 yo, 10 yo, 8 yo and 1 6 yo boy, were alone for the night at the hotel. Waiting for our parents to get home. And our hotel room got a phone call. Must be mom and dad calling to tell us they are on their way from the bar. Number. It was only like... 11 p.m. anyways, way earlier than their 3 or 4 a.m. usual. It was a strange man, using a voice manipulator, who told my 13 yo, oldest sister, I'm going to rape you, you should tell your mom that. And minutes later, a 12 inch, wrench was thrown at the sliding glass door. Thank god it didn't break the door, just bounced back. Definitely should have called the cops that time. I'm surprised that out of the two couples that were on each side of us, who had also stepped outside with us kids, neither of them called the cops. Told our parents when they got home hours later, but they were drunk. I very clearly remember walking the wrench inside, feeling the weight of it, I am the 10 yo, and shaking it and my mom's drunk, half lidded face saying they threw this at our door, to break it, to get to us. My sisters and I talked about this later on in life. We don't blame ourselves but, we deeply regret not calling the cops. Our parents were more than just drunk that night. My boyfriend actually, having a night out with the boys, drinking at a buddy's house. One friend starts to get too drunk, saying scary things, trying to fight everyone. They are trying to calm him down and get him to sleep it off, but he somehow manages to get outside and into his car to go home but instead floors it, runs a stop sign, slams into a parked car causing him to spin and slam into another car. My boyfriend said he ran outside right as it happened and when he saw how fast he went and how hard he hit he was certain he was dead. 
He ran down the road absolutely terrified he would find him dead in the seat. Luckily he was okay. His car however was absolutely totaled. I posted this before but was well late tardy party so I am reposting here because it is my one and only real paranormal weird things that has happened to me. Years ago I visited a friend who had moved to a small town in northern Canada. We were going camping and meeting some of his friends. We left his place around 7. It was about a 2 hour drive to where we were going. Once you are out of the town limits it gets pretty remote. Very few cars etc. Nothing much between towns except forest. On the horizon we saw bright lights. I was excited as I have never seen the northern lights and I heard you could occasionally from the area we were in. Anyway we stopped for maybe 10 minutes and carried on. We eventually pull into the campground and it was totally dark. No lights lanterns anywhere. No fires. I thought maybe we went to the wrong spot. Eventually we see a flashlight and hear a tent unzip. It was one of his friends. He thought we bailed so they went to bed. I looked at my watch because I thought it was a little lame they would be in bed so early. And it was midnight. We lost it conservatively 2 hours closer to 3. No idea where the time went. We did not stop for more than 10-15 minutes and I am positive we left at 7. Still freaks me out to this day and we have no explanation. When I was 19 I texted my boyfriend. Wanna get high and go to Texas Roadhouse. Except I accidentally sent it to my dad. Who, as far as I knew, thought I was a super straight laced kid and would completely lose his crap if he knew I smoked weed. I prepared for the absolute worst. He responded. I maybe when you're 21. Completely unexpected response. Turns out he was a major pothead and I had no clue. We did end up smoking together a few times years later. Wholesome stoner moment. When I crashed my car back in 2010. I was on a dirt road going about 60. Hey frick it. 9 feet tall. Bulletproof and invincible. And I hit a pothole. The back end of the car kicked up and sent the car into a sideways drift. In that instant, it hit me that I was in some serious crap. The primal fear of what I'd just gotten myself into kicked, and I experienced time dilation. Everything appeared to be moving at half speed, and I could see there was absolutely nothing I could do to recover the situation. The car violently swerved back the other way, and was headed directly towards a huge white pine tree with a bunch of thick dead branches hanging off it. I cranked the wheel as hard as I could to try and get one more swerve out of the car and avoid becoming shish kebab man. The car entered a small ditch right in front of this tree, and the rear wheels got hitched to a culvert. This pole vaulted the car straight up, and away from the tree at a slight angle. Now, this is where time really slowed down. I was upside down, 10 feet in the air, flying into the forest at Mac Jesus. I could see the sun through the branches and little pools of light in the vegetation. I also saw where I was going to land, on a massive boulder. The slow motion sensation left, and my car smashed into this boulder upside down, crushing in the entire roof. Aside from the driver's side, the car rolled down the boulder and landed right side up. I'm pretty sure I blacked part of this out, but I just remember snapping back into reality convinced I'd been seriously injured. There was absolutely nothing wrong with me. Not even the slightest indication I'd just neoed my way around death. My best friend was driving behind me and came sprinting up to the car, also convinced I was dead. He saw me looking around, and kicked the door off and started checking for injuries. He told me not to move anything until paramedics got there to assess me. I didn't really register much, aside from how lucky I'd gotten. I didn't really eat or sleep much the next week either. This also happened to be one of the few times I'd ever decided to wear a seatbelt. That, no doubt, saved my life. What also got to me was if I'd had any passengers, they would have all died. The only part of the car that didn't resemble crushed aluminum foil was the driver's seat. That's what hit me hardest my best friend who ran to check on me, that I'd known since preschool, could have easily been sitting beside me, a victim of my stupidity. Now I buckle up and drive like a granny. I might get there late, but at least I'll get there. That moment the pilot says alright folks, we're turning around and making an emergency landing at Reno airport. Blood drains from extremities and everything gets cold. Comma for a medical emergency. Then you feel like a terrible person for being grateful it's just a medical emergency that doesn't really involve you. Oof, so intimate with that feel. Work at a trauma center, 
Or frick trauma coming in. Oh they aren't now Hugh. Or frick that means they died en route. I was laying in my new boyfriend's room one afternoon one room one the second floor of a very large, very old house shared by many other college guys. It used to be a convent. We start hearing creepy scratching noises coming from his closet. He goes to check and we are the only people on the whole floor. So the scratching isn't one of his neighbors. It keeps rustling and scratching. The scratching sounded like it was getting closer and then the door rattled. We are both really scared. My boyfriend jumped up and moved to the closet and I moved to the doorway ready to bolt. He threw open the door and shrieked. All I could see were glowing eyes looking back at us. My boyfriend slammed the door, made sure it was closed, and grabbed me as he ran downstairs. What the heck was that I shouted? A terrified raccoon. I'm going to need to call someone about that. Realizing my friends and I were being stalked through a dark parking lot by some sketchy gangster and having to book it to the car and nearly run him over when he pulled a gun. Getting arrested, there's a sudden rush of thoughts as well as disappointment in yourself. If this is uncommon for you, what will think of this? I thought about letting my mom down and why I was doing what got me arrested. I used to be a little klepto. I was arrested, the second and final time, for stealing beef jerky and goldfish crackers. I was leaving a party drunk and wanted snacks. Also was a stupid teenager. Basically anytime I hear the snapping of a twig outside of my tent, it's obviously a mountain lion who will pounce on my tent at any second. Those goddang mountain lions. I was 16 and I was staying the night at my mother's house. I did not have a room there so I would sleep on the couch in the living room, which was a pain in the butt because my stepdad would stay up until 2 or 3 watching TV. One night I am awoken by the shouts and screams of a man saying something unintelligible, but it sounded like I yeah ye but ep die. This terrified the crap out of me. I recognized it as my stepdad's voice and it sounded like he had lost his freaking mind. I grabbed a knife from the kitchen and sat outside my mom's room. I could hear her inside trying to quiet him which alleviated my fears that he had hurt her. So, I stayed up all night outside their door in case anything was to happen. Thankfully nothing did. My mom told me the next day that he had woken her up that night and asked her to pray with him. At that point he began wildly speaking in tongues. I have a lot, but the one I always come back to is my hallucination. When I was in 4th grade, I had lice. Because of this, I had to sleep on the floor so they wouldn't get in my bed. One night, I woke up at 3am and rolled over. I was staring under my bed. It was bunk bed and I slept on the top bunk and decided that was too creepy. I looked up in hopes of seeing something cute staring over the edge of my bed, but instead, I saw a man. He was crouching on my bed, staring down at me with these lifeless white eyes. What I will always remember about him is his skin. It was pale grey and looked papery. It was pulled tight on his thin body. I could see every vein. It was covered in these grey spots that resembled liver spots. I rolled over and refused to look at him for the rest of the night. When I woke up, he was gone. Every time I think of the story, of his empty eyes and his paper skin, I shudder. I'm sure it was just a hallucination, but still, a part of me wonders if he was real. I had an experience during Hurricane Sandy that made my blood run cold. We lost power for a week, and all of our phones were dead. My family members decided they were going to go to a relative's house to charge up and shower, etc. This was during the time that I was rather into smoking, so I took it as an opportunity to have a nice smoke and enjoy the quiet house and read for a bit. I stayed home, so I take my dog for a walk, do my thing, everything is cool. It's pretty windy but no rain at the moment, and it's midday so the neighborhood is pretty empty with most people at work. As we approach the house I notice a guy standing on the curb across the street from my house, wearing a scarf a mask covering the bottom half of his face and holding a chainsaw. Immediately I get a little nervous because there's no one else around, and hello paranoia, but I don't think anything of it and keep walking towards the house. Just as I'm about to set foot on my property, he fires up the chainsaw and starts power walking towards me, not quite jogging, but brisk and right at me. I freak the frick out and hustle my poor, old, overweight dog into the house with my heart beating out of my chest. I barely make it and he zips past me into the backyard. 
At this point I'm freaking out because I have no phone. The house phone is dead. And none of my neighbors are home. And my family isn't supposed to come back for a few hours. I stood midway between the back and front doors of the house armed with a kitchen knife for a good half hour. While my guardian angel dog who clearly sensed my distress barked at this chainsaw dude. He eventually went away. I have no idea where. Since I resorted to hiding at that point. Later was informed by my hysterically laughing family that he had come to get rid of a tree that had fallen in the backyard. Why no one told me, and why he basically lunged at me with an active chainsaw, is a mystery to me. But yeah, definitely thought I was gonna die that day. Woke up one morning to my mom calling my name. She had uncovered my bird and discovered him tangled in a mesh I foolishly put in there. His head was completely through one hole and he was upside down, with others tangled around his wings and more of his head. He wasn't moving, or making noise. I immediately felt like throwing up but I grabbed my razor and started cutting the pieces tied around him. When I finally got his neck free I saw that he was just staring saint me, watching me. I breathed such a huge sigh of relief. He didn't leave my side for the next few days and anything that looks like that mesh did. He's terrified of. Losing a loved one is awful. But losing a loved one because of something you did, is something I wouldn't wish upon my worst enemy. I'm relieved that this had a happy ending for you. We had our bird for 23 years and he was absolutely a member of the family. Had a couple of close calls with him that scared the daylights out of us. I know that feeling well. I once had a hallucination of someone walking in my kitchen. I could hear them very clearly but couldn't see them. I had just woken up and as I grew more alert the sound grew more distant but I had a minor freak out when I opened the kitchen door and nobody was there. I regularly have the experience of waking up and thinking for no logical reason, that someone else is in the room with me or in a room nearby. It freaks me out that I can't remember who it is or when they got there until I finally become alert enough to realize there's no one around. So weird every time. I've posted this a couple of times. My dad lived in a rented house around 20 years ago and used to say he would wake up or come home to the picture of me and my sister turned around or face down. I assumed he was playing a trick and didn't take much notice. Flash forward and I am a domestic builder and get chatting to a customer whose daughter has just brought a house on the street my dad rented the house. It turns out to be the very same house. She said it was a nice house but strange thing kept happening to the pictures being turned around. I used to sell pot illegally to a few friends, and one fake friend of a friend. I was having my cereal one morning when I looked out the window and saw a van pull up. Out of which came a line of men aiming assault rifles in attack formation. I desperately flushed some pot down the toilet, then got a knee on my neck and I spent that night in jail. 5 years probation, which was fortunately shortened to 3 years by Georgia's governor, Nathan Deal. This happened when I was in 10th grade. We had a milkman who also used to bring his dog which was as big as a small bear and that dog used to enjoy sleeping under our car. So before leaving for school, I used to roll few stones under the car, making sure none of them hit him, and shoo it away. A couple of months later, we had to shift into new apartments. Everything was moved and only my dog was left at our old apartment. It was 5am and as I was walking with my dog towards the new apartment, I heard a growl coming from some distance away. So I turned around and saw this dog running at full speed towards me. My knees and my back just froze. There were no stones or anything I could defend myself with and there was no way I was abandoning my dog. There was no way my dog could defend me as that dog was twice as big as my dog and his head was larger than my head. This whole time me and that dog had our eyes locked with each other while my dog took a pee at the lamppost behind me. After coming within a few feet of me, that dog jumped, opened his jaws while going for my neck. In my head I thought so this is how I die. Ha. Huh. Just as I lost all hope. I saw a black flash in the corner of my eye and the next moment my dog tackled him throwing him a couple of feet away. But this dog wasn't done yet. He circled behind me and jumped again going for the back of my neck. But this time my dog got his neck. The next moment was filled with that dog's screams and my dog's growls. He somehow managed to free my dog's grip and ran away with his tail between his legs. Haven't seen that milkman or the dog ever since. Holy frick man. Your doggo saved your life. Landing on a snowy runway, the plane tipped over onto the front and left landing wheels, 
lurched back to all three, and skidded sideways for a short while. It was probably a lot less dramatic than it seemed, but I thought I was gonna die. 1. My mum, sis and I were at the backyard eating breakfast at the patio thing. At the backyard we have these wires that we use to hang clothes. On one of the wires were 12 hangers, all near each other. Suddenly a hanger at the middle of the 12 starts spinning. It spun slowly but it was spinning. None of the other hangers spun. There was no strong wind, just the middle hanger spun. We couldn't believe our eyes. My mum asked if we saw what she was seeing. We answered yes and bolted back inside. 2. When I was 9-10 I got pneumonia. My grandmother from another province of our country flew over to watch over my sister and I. My mum was taking the bar exam which was held in our country's capital. I was admitted to the hospital and while I was there my grand watched over me. During the first two days in the hospital I had a reoccurring nightmare of someone banging on my hospital room door trying to enter. On the third night had the same dream but this time. The door burst open. A girl, imagine Sadako from the ring, comes into the room. And I turn to see my grandma, who slept on a couch next to my bed, staring at her too. The Sadako girl leans in close to my gran and I see her whisper to my gran. Then I wake up in a cold sweat. My gran hears my gasp and wakes up too. She asks me what was wrong I told her nothing it was just a bad dream. Then she asks me if I saw the girl too. Apparently we had been sharing the same dream for the past 3 nights. In THW morning she has my mum release me from the hospital and bring me home. We later found out a kid in the room next to mine died 2 days after I left. That gave me chills. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video. Bye for now.